just a bloke in a bar. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Bloke in a Bar, brought to you by a massive, massive announcement. February 1st at 6 p.m. So that's a Wednesday, February 1st at 6 p.m. Not only are we dropping new bloke shirts, and they're the, some of the best shirts we've ever done. Trust me, guys. Some of the best shirts we've ever done. We are giving 50% off everything, including those drop shirts. So first I thought, you know what? The, the, the community, the bloke community, I'm sure they lavish their loved ones in gifts over Chrissy. It's February, you know, you're still kind of recovering. So you know what we're doing? We're doing half price, February 1st, brand new drop of shirts. Plus everything else on the site is also gonna be 50% off for 50 hours. February 1st, 6 p.m. Set your alarms, guys. We've never done a sale like this before. Honestly, I'm not sure whether we'll ever do it again. It was just something I sat back and said, well, look, we we're gonna drop new shirts. Why don't we do something cool around it? 50% off. So usually the shirts are around 50 bucks, 25 bucks for a brand new bloke shirt that's never been released or done before. Uh, got these shirts right here, this soccer shirt that I'm wearing. Have a look at it. 50% off. The soccer shirt I was wearing last week, 50% off. Perfect to go to the gym in, everything. So that is February 1st, 6 p.m. 50% off everything on bloke.shop for 50 hours. Uh, we got thongs, boardies, singlets, party shirts, everything absolutely everything but so make sure to set your alarms guys because once these like i don't know when we'll ever do this again 50 percent off everything brand new shirt drop 6 p.m february 1st i've got the great gurino here how you going brother good mate you're giving away shirts over there mate it's fucking i tell you what it's close to it's close to matter of fact i feel like they give off offer so much value i am giving away shirts always taking care of you can be uh, <laughs> um timmy what do you reckon? You reckon you'll be there for the, the huge 50% off a 50 hours sale? Oh, mate, I've loaded up. <laughs> I'm, I'm that, I've been waiting for a, for a discount on it just because I'm a poor man from our humble beginnings. And, <laughs> mate, it's just, it's just too cheap to refuse. So 25 I, bucks I, for I a fucking bloke I shirt. wait for it. Bloody heaven. <laughs> Matty, what do you reckon, mate? How have you been? Been good. I reckon, like, you, you're hard pressed these days going to freaking Kmart and buying a plain shirt for 15, 20 bucks. So. 25 bucks for a t-shirt these days is crazy. And once we reveal it, and stay tuned for the reveal of the drop, they're the fucking boys. The boys know, they've seen them. Let's just put it this way. It's, it's a big, it's often left in the comment section as to uh, this, this running joke. And they look really cool, unique design. It's not just like uh, letters on the back, like Aussie bloke or, you know, whatever. It's, uh, it's actual design. So anyway. When are we getting the, uh, the lime green bloke drop? I'll buy an absolute bulk. Ah, oh, see, mate. always, mate. You can <laughs> always bring it back to the Raiders. Seriously. Fuck that shit. Um, no, just all, all jokes aside. Um, the Canberrians love the bloke kit, actually. Yeah, a lot of people in Canberra love bloke kit. So you go down to your local game these days, there's bloke kit bloody everywhere. Mm. It's, it's, uh, it's actually really humbling. Anyway, Matty, how many times have you scissored this week so far? Um... Oh, more than one, less than five. It's fucking Monday, bro. <laughs> it's there's Monday nothing, morning. There's nothing to do. It's no Monday on. morning. <laughs> you need to, to just rein her in. You're a sicko. It's Monday morning. Uh, Holy shit. You reckon he's already on the gear, on the, on the tools? Speaking of Matty, how's your, uh, how's your shin feeling? Oh, shit. My shin feeling? Oh, well, we can't reveal how it happened because it's content that will be released <laughs> in a week or so. But... Oh, a bit longer than that, actually. But I will say this. Maddie, never trust Maddie in a cricket net. Let's just put it that way. It may or may not be a video of Maddie shitting himself live. Shitting himself live, but also <laughs> yeah. abusing his boss. Like, actual abuse. If I had HR, I would have gone to him. Like, absolutely craziness. But we'll release that footage in due time. Maddie, Maddie take a bit of inspiration from Sel and Cobbo. Oh, that was a low blow. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you, sir? <laughs> that hurt. That is unfair, Timmy. That is unfair. You know what? That's a typical Raiders low blow. Use a grub, Can be if it makes you feel any better. I've got a bit of a, a war story of my own from the weekend. I was sitting there having a cheeky little beer with the guru, and he sometimes he just pisses me off. You know oh, that is, mate, I feel you. I feel, no, mate, I feel you. And he just looked at me funny, so it just annoyed me. So I flogged him one in the gut. <laughs> anyway, mate, this is the result. <laughs> No way. Busted finger. Is that legit? Turns out he's got cheese grater abs underneath. The chair. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Holy yeah, fuck. Note to self. Don't what? take him on. Guru is actually Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> <laughs> Holy. And did you choose green or did you, was it just all fate? 
Let's just say it, w- it wasn't a uh, coincidence that we landed on lime green and blue, mate. Oh, far <laughs> out. Make me sick. You make me sick. Anyway, let's get into the footy chat. Bit of breaking news. The Penny Panthers have released a statement. We are literally re- reading this statement for the first time. We haven't read it yet. All we saw was the headline, Crichton set to depart at the end of this year. So this is a statement. Penrith Panthers can confirm that the club was notified overnight by Stephen Crichton's management group that he will be seeking opportunities elsewhere in 2024. Contrary to media reports, the club has made a substantial offer in May 2022 for Stephen to remain at the Panthers and when disappointed, the club could not reach an agreement at that point in time. Given the uncertainty surrounding the NRL salary cap and CBA negotiations, contract negotiations were, negotiations, discussion, sorry, were put on hold at the back end of 2022 while the club worked to establish its position. As a dual premiership winner and World Cup player, external interest in Stephen's services were to be expected. And although the club was working to maintain the representative player, Stephen made the decision to move forward with other interests. interests. Although Panthers is disappointed by the outcome, the club respects Stephen's decision and understands the situation exacerbated by salary cap pressure based on the club's recent success, Panthers CEO said. The club thanks Stephen for his efforts and is looking forward to seeing him represent the Panthers for the remainder of the 23 season. Crichton said he's fully committed to finishing the year strong with the Panthers. He said, it was the hardest decision to make, but now my full focus is on the 23 season and finishing my time at the Panthers as strong as I can. It's going to be a tough to leave my teammates, but we will have our chance to make more memories this year. I know my friendships at Panthers won't finish here, but will last forever. In respect to all parties involved, the Panthers will make... No further comment on the matter at this time. I think that it's like when you look at the river or an ocean and it just looks like it's calm at the top. It looks like it's calm. Jump in. Jump in. You jump in. Before you know it, you're in a fucking river rapid underneath. I think there's. it seems like there's more to this than meets the eye. Um, and apologies to Panthers if there isn't. I apologise to Stephen Crichton if there isn't. But this is, this is shocking. Like... Stephen Crichton, back-to-back, premiership winner, Dally M Center, World Cup hero, already being told you will not like go and find something else when, A, what's interesting is they talked about the, the negotiations with the NRL. That's not even finished yet. So he's still in a position where, Guru, what are your thoughts on the situation? Yeah, I think it's the price you pay for success in this mm. competition, realistically. Um, I mean... You go and have a look through the, the last year and you go and have a look at all the players that the Penrith Panthers have re-signed. There has been a stack of them, an absolute stack of them. So, uh, as you said, I think there's some rapids under the calm that uh, that that portrays. But, uh, yeah, I think there's a bit more that's gone on here. Yeah, because it's – but, I mean, this is how the best clubs handle it is that you're always like, man, something else is going on there. But they come at it as a united front. And, and again, this is all assumptions, and I apologise to Panthers and Critter if it isn't the case that more has gone on and it's simply the fact that he was offered a good offer and he just wanted some more, from, you know, a bigger offer. Um, Timmy, what do you reckon, mate? Yeah, I'm not that surprised, to be honest. It's just Guru nailed it and it's the, it's the price you pay for success. You, you know, two consecutive comps in a row, every player in your squad is going up in value substantially and you have to make cuts somewhere. Now, they've locked in their won their six and their seven all on big money among a host of other players throw Isaiah Yo on top of that at 13. the obvious spot where money is lost or, or, or that you're willing to give up in your squads is i think probably the outside backs uh, in particular center because it's a replay quite a replaceable position now i'm not saying they'll be able to replace stephen crichton but where he might have been on three fifty four hundred thousand dollars the last few years at the Penrith on on uh, not on unders what he was probably valued at at the time, he now rightly can go elsewhere and command seven hundred thousand eight hundred thousand maybe nine hundred if he wants to pay full play fullback and another club wants to pay him that to play fullback which someone probably will. Um, they had to cut corners not cut corners someone had to be cut somewhere and it is Stephen Crichton and yeah I'm just I'm not that surprised. Mm. I'm surprised. I'm really surprised. I felt like he was a – the fact that he wanted to stay and it hasn't been able to work out, like, I don't know, you know, is it as simple as, you know, salary cap or is it more the positions in their top 30 squad or they know that he's going to eventually be too much money? Um, Let's put it this right. What would you pay him if you're 
Penrith, let's assume there's some salary cap uh, restraints, what would you pay him? As in, like, if I'm trying to get him on a bit unders because I have just, cap restraints? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably 500, four to 500. What are you paying him, let's say, the Bulldogs to play fullback for you in 24? Maybe 750. But, and, and we've spoken about this before, mm-hmm. the, the thing is, is our understanding was only, what, a week or so ago that, that it may be the fact that it's not actually about that extra money and playing fullback. It was, it may be more about, you know, the fact that he, because like, I don't know, I don't know where I read it. So apologies if it's not, you know, not true, but I fuck, I felt like I read his manager saying that they hadn't been offered yet or something like mm-hmm. that. Or I don't know, but you know, the Panthers are saying they did have an offer for him at the end of last year. So um, that must be the case. I'm still surprised. I'm still surprised because if you're going to get paid four, four, four or 500 grand as a premiership favorite to win your third premiership, he's what, 22 years old. I would very, if I'm a manager like that cares about the player, I would strongly consider saying, mate, take the four or 500, you're 22, you might win another comp. You know, even if you just sign a one year deal and then get the fucking big dog deal next year, it's going to be there. Like everyone sees how talented you are. You already won the two. It's not like you're going to come out and play like a busted. Uh, you know, I will say that he's going to be a great pickup for another club. It's going to be interesting to see, is he going to play fullback? Is it going to be center? What do you got there, Matty? Yeah, it looks like they hadn't offered him anything until like basically, basically now. So who said that though? I'm going off what Phil Rothfield's saying. He said, it's been a stalemate for some time. I spoke about the fact that Penrith have not made Crichton yet an offer. I'm told they'll make him an offer this week. That was released an hour ago. That article. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So there does seem to be quite a lot going on here. That There's a bit happening. A bit yeah. happening that doesn't seem mm-hmm. to... Because like, if, if it is... And look, I'm not going to... Like, Buzz Rothfield, he might have the wrong information and Panthers are telling the truth. I'm not... But if it is true that Buzz is telling the truth and, and that an offer hadn't been made, that's very bizarre. It, because like the, the, the NRL negotiations with the players, it's not the big dogs that are getting affected. Most clubs know that there's going to be at least $10 million or whatever in the cap. It's the, it's the edges that, that are still struggling to get the edge contracts. If we're talking numbers as well, it's, it says on this that the Panthers were going to table an offer this week for about 600, um, but obviously won't match what rivals are willing to pay. I, don't, I, I can't believe a world where Critter is going to leave the Panthers for an extra 200K a year, 150. Like 800K would be a big deal for him. I would probably land him around the 700K mark if I'm going to, and I'm going to play fullback, maybe even 650. Like I, I was surprised. Sorry, to, to stay at Penrith or to go elsewhere? To go elsewhere. Like I'm surprised with 600 to a centre with the team that you have. I'm surprised at that. That's more than I thought as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, I, it's, I would, it would be very surprising to me if Critter was got getting offered 600 by the Panthers, and he wanted to leave. He's all his mates he grew up. With, he's from the area. Like his connection to that is more than just rugby league. It's his fucking blood. It's his family. Everything to go to the Bulldogs. Who, yes, okay, they signed really well, but they're still not a finals footy side. We don't know yet. Yeah, look. It doesn't surprise me in the sense that, of course, there's going to be heaps of interest in Critter. He's a gun. It just, I just feel like there's maybe a bit more going on here. Yeah, I think that Penrith would be looking at their squad right now. They've got Taruva there for another two years. They've got young Tom Jenkins. They've got on a minimum. number of guys there that they're not Stephen Crichton, don't get me wrong, but mm. I think the Panthers would be backing themselves to take one of these two or three guys they've got that would be on two, 300K. Mm put them into the best back line in the competition outside, mm. the best halfback inside, the best winger outside, one of the mm. best second rowers in the game and make it work. Mm. Well, I mean, Taruva would be on minimum, like so 150K or whatever it is. They've also got uh, Iongi, I think his name is. Yep. He's, he's a fullback, you know, maybe outside back, but fullback. He's also now, you know, so we were talking about how they'd fit Taruva in, in the squad. And so maybe that's what they have done. They've said, you know what, like we know Critter, even if he signs a one-year deal, he's still going to be worth six, seven hundred k the next year. So we're always going to be fighting. I just can't see a world unless you're the best center in the game, paying a center. And I, I saw someone in the comment section that really disagreed with this, which is respect. Um, in regards to, they felt like you you should be able to pay centers a lot of money. I personally just in a salary cap environment where you've got to focus your money on other areas. I just don't know how you can pay a center six hundred k whilst you've got other superstars in the side. Um, but yeah, look, I hope Critter gets the biggest deal he can get because now it's a position of like, all right, the club that I loved and, you know, grew up with, rah, rah, you know, I've been squeezed out because of our success. 
So become a professional. Accept the, the best offer that is for your family and, and you, what your career is going to be in the next few years or whatever. Now, do we think guarantee Bulldogs essentially? Like without a certainty, would you say that there's like pretty much be paying a dollar dollar fifty to land at the doggies? I think it's very likely. Mm. Timmy? Yeah, I think barring any changes between now and whenever he signs a contract, dollar thirty. Dollar thirty? Go on yeah, fucking yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh, just just look at my options, and I think a dollar thirty. I don't want to off, be offering any more. I'd be snapping up the dollar fifty. You s- punter. It's snapping the dollar fifty. Yeah. Let us know in the comments section. You snapping a dollar fifty up on the doggies <laughs> or what? What do you reckon, Maddie? Dogs or what? Yeah, where there's smoke, there's fire, and that seems to be the theme of this whole Crichton uh, fiasco. What's going on? So yeah, I, he will end up with the dogs. I reckon. Can you offer me a dollar fifty, Campy? <laughs> look, I'll, I'll, gotta speak, I'll speak to me people. What's I'll get max, back to you. What's your max bet, mate? Or is it that a- wasn't binding? That dollar fifty. That was just a number thrown out. <laughs> you look at the terms and service, and you'll see in the fucking the fine print, not binding. Can change at any time. Uh, prices fluctuate and you didn't get on it you haven't put your money out um, <laughs> what's interesting though is that okay so the Panthers come out they make that statement and what I, I really respect from both parties is although there was a little bit of like you could be a bit of tension in regards to like did they offer did they not offer what is best for both parties if the Panthers aren't going to move then it's best for them just to come out as a joint force, say what they said, even if even if you know Critter feels a little bit of a way or the Panthers feel a little bit of a way, because like you don't want to give any fuel to the fire if they you know the Penrith Panthers come out and struggle next year or whatever. So this is the most professional manner forward, and I would say like all the best clubs, this is how they handle things. Even if internally there's disagreements, they project a sense of unity to everyone else, and Penrith Panthers deserve a massive rap for that. Um, I will say as well, I don't think they would have come out with this public statement that he is absolutely not going to be at a club unless Critter was pretty close to sign with someone else. Yeah. Because, like, that, that's almost cutting him out to dry. Because if you care about Critter and you come out as a club and say, no, nah, we won't have him next year, all of a sudden the other clubs, the dogs and that go, well, they don't want to re-sign you, so we're offering, you know, 100 grand less or whatever. They can, they've got less pressure to deal with. So I think that... I think we'll find there'll probably be an announcement within the next few weeks into Critter's future, and I think probably they've already probably agreed to it behind the scenes. Uh, but yeah, really interesting. Good luck to Critter, mate. Could you imagine leaving on a three-peat? Holy shit! Super exciting to see him. Hopefully, play fullback too. Yeah, I for sure. That good, hey, yeah. oh, mate. So they've gone with Burton. They got Flano or whoever they end up putting there. Critter at the back, Adokar on the wing, kick out. Reed Marnie, ooh, ooh. Stoggies fans, if this happens, is starting to shape Andrew up. Andrew Davey. Okay. The great Andrew Davey on an edge. Ooh. Doesn't get much better than that. Uh, yeah, really interesting. Let's know what you think about the situation. Is it just a, a, a matter of, look, the Panthers, they're successful. They're going to lose their superstars. Or do you think that um, they should have done everything they can to try to keep Critter in the squad? February 1st, 50% off everything. We're dropping a brand new sh- well, brand new shirt February 1st at 6 p.m. They're going to be 50% off. And then we thought, stuff it. Not just the brand new drop's going to be 50% off. Everything on bloke.shop will be 50% off for 50 hours. After that, I don't know when we'll ever do this again, guys. But 50% off the drop. So you're looking at 25 bucks for a shirt, a brand new bloke shirt. Or 50% on everything else. We've got party shirts. We've got thongs. We've got boardies. We've got singlets. We've got everything on there. So that's bloke.shop. 50% off the drop and then 50% off everything for 50 hours. For those of you who aren't good at math, that's a little bit over two days. Um, that's February 1st, 6 p.m. February 1st, 6 p.m., 50% off everything. Munster has come out and said, basically, he was a little bit disappointed uh, of what Wayne had said. And, you know, he had planned to call Wayne, uh, but then he saw the comments about, you know, man enough to call and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, kind of ended it a little bit bitterly, uh, the negotiations. Uh, really interesting. You know, I, I love uh, Munster's honesty. I think this is this is the the good thing about this from a fan's perspective is you're getting both of their perspectives of a contract negotiation and how tense this can get. You don't really see like so much is riding on this thing happening that it's almost crazy we don't see more fallouts in regards to club getting pissed off they didn't sign someone. But anyway, what did you think of the great Munster's comments? I don't mind it to be honest with you, mate. Uh, you know, obviously with this story, we don't have the full context and we haven't seen everything from behind the scenes. We don't know who's right and wrong. Exactly right. But so. we, I like him stand up for himself. I, I like it. And I mean, I think it's pretty evident. If I was Wayne, I'd be frustrated with how it's all going. Mm. Uh, and I think that uh, that moment probably showed how frustrating it is up there when you put Wayne Bennett, Peter O'Sullivan, like 
and you still haven't signed a marquee guy, I'd be frustrated. So I get where Munster's coming from. I, and my, as you said, I love that he's honest. Yeah. I think it's great to see. And it's interesting, um, so someone put up um, like a tweet or whatever I read in the Fox article, basically saying, I can't believe Munster didn't call and, you know, no respect. And I think it was Christian Walsh, um, he commented back. And Christian Walsh, he's fucking not afraid to say how he feels. He commented back, um, you know, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, where was the respect when Munster was essentially approached before November 1st? There's no respect shown anyone else then. Uh, Timmy, what do you reckon about the comments? Yeah, it's a really interesting one because... Wayne Bennett's obviously such a godlike figure within rugby league circles, and you know it takes a brave man or woman to, to stand up against uh, against Wayne, the super coach. And uh, like your boy said, we don't know the context of it all, but for Cam Munster to come come out and stand up for himself after Bennett's comments that, that did obviously go public, um, good on him. Um, mm. You know he has a right to do so, and it's a brave thing to do it against Wayne. Mm. Um, and, and that's you know so we don't know what's happened behind the scenes, who's in the right, who's in the wrong, but. Uh, in this day where we speak about quite often on this podcast how so many interviews are boring and no one gives their true opinion and it's just like blase uh, to have someone like Munster to actually call a spade a spade and speak up for himself it's good to see yeah it's in, as I said we're not ascribing right or wrong to the situation because mm. look to be fair like I if I was trying to sign someone and they didn't and it was a big signing I'd want them to give me a call for sure so I can understand where Wayne's coming from but if you know if, if you're in Munster's shoes and he was going to call him on top of that, like how many clubs call, you know, players themselves when they go cold on them? You know, probably they probably don't. Um, the difference is, is this is a player that's on 1.2 million, but is there cl- like players that are on a lower level that, that don't get a call personally from, uh, you know, the head coach or whatever? So I can understand both sides. Um, I'm just going to read you the quotes so people listening are going, what the hell is going on now? Um, so... Basically, uh, and again, this isn't Munster coming out to say this. He did an interview with Channel 7 and they obviously asked him how he felt about, um, you know, what Wayne said. And and Wayne just said, it's disappointing. I have a really good relationship with Wayne and I don't know if it made it any worse. There's no excuses. I should have given him a call. I definitely will give him all a call. I think that's a respectful thing to do. Um, Sorry, that's what Munster said after he touched down in the UK. So I think this was before the comments of, of Wayne about the, you know, being man enough. Um, and then obviously he hadn't made that phone call and then those comments come out. And then now today Munster has said, I felt like it was pretty disappointing, Bennett's comments. And there probably was a little bit of animosity towards it. So that's one of the reasons why I haven't decided to ring him. I guess you can, I guess, understand both perspectives, to be honest. Like he's trying to, he's traveling to bloody England to mm. play. And then, but Wayne's trying to build a club together. Uh, but yeah, what about what about you, Timmy? What do you reckon about uh, the great Mad Dog Monsters comments, Timmy or Matty? Sorry, Matty. <laughs> um, I was pretty shocked to be honest because it kind of just came out of the blue um, when I was like looking around this morning. Um, I don't really know if it needed to be said. Like it's kind of just created something out of nothing. Like I appreciate his honesty and stuff, but like I don't really see the point of it. Just well, he's been he's in a, he's in an interview. Yeah, I know, but like. It just seems. Oh, you reckon he should have just said, "Oh, no comment." Oh, I'm, I'm not really here or there. I'm just, I'm just, I just don't really see the point of the comments. I just, yeah. I just, I, I'd personally forgotten about it. I, I. Think uh, well, I'll put it this way then, and, and obviously I respect your opinion on it. But what would you, what would you do if someone said that you weren't a man publicly? And you know, fair enough. Maybe that had been eating away at Cam Munster for months, and it probably would to me too. So yeah, if I look at it from Munster's perspective, it's probably something. He might not have needed to get off his chest, but maybe like subconsciously he wanted to get it out there because he felt hurt by those comments and mm. and fair enough. So yeah, maybe, maybe maybe I've turned a little bit. Maybe it's all right. But yeah, I just as a pure spectator. From a fan's I'd, perspective, you're kind of like the, the, the best case scenario so there isn't new headlines is don't mm. say anything. Mm. Um, but I can understand like if you get, if, if someone said I wasn't man enough to call them and I was planning to call them like Munster said, he said he had every intention of calling. But it was, uh, so basically this is what Munster said further on. I just didn't like the way they went about it and probably threw my name in the media. It was pretty pretty disrespected and saying I wasn't man enough to ring him. I had every intention to, but after those comments, we felt like it was in our best interest to just leave it alone. Um, yeah, so I, I can, from a fan's perspective, you're right. Like the, the smart thing would be like, don't say anything. Um, I, I enjoy the fact that, you know, he's coming out and defending himself in regards to, if someone said to me I wasn't man enough to do something, my the, the ego would immediately make me want it. Like there's a lot of things you can say that I'll be like, you know what, fuck, whatever. But not man enough. That that hits you right in the fucking feels. That shit. That hits you right in the feels. I guess as well. And, and this is coming from a Queensland Origins perspective. Even though the 2020 series sucks as a Blues fan, it's 
it'll be talked about forever how Munster came in late. Yep. Uh, he asked Wayne for, and that's and this is kind of like, you know, made that like their relationships kind of been affected now. So it kind of takes a little bit of gloss off that I think, and I find that a little sad. But that's very minor. I mean, to be fair, you, you could make the argument like for the Dolphins to come out and say the initial comments was, was, uh, didn't need to be said. Anyway, gets us, we get to talk about it, which is great. It's great stuff. <laughs> um, but as I said, I, I, like, what I don't mind about this is like no one's getting hurt. Rah, rah. It's, as you said to me, we want our NRL players to say how they feel and, and, and not have to give the cookie cutter answers. And that's what we're getting. We're getting Wayne Bennett saying how he felt, Munster saying how he felt. No one's getting hurt. I like it. And as you said, you could make the argument for the... I mean, if the Dolphins would have signed Latrell Mitchell the day after, do you reckon they come out and make this statement? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So if they sign a big superstar, yeah. they're probably like, yeah, it's, it's, it's... I think it is built on the fact of, like, he was the guy they were going to land. Um, anyway, some other big news coming out. Kalen Ponga has been confirmed. He will play six. Uh, spoke about this just briefly on uh, social media. But essentially, Adam O'Brien has confirmed that he'll play six. He's also confirmed that Ponga came back with the, the squad when everyone else came back. It's essentially the longest. You know, I know they say every preseason is the best preseason, but he's, he came back, I think, the earliest he's ever come back. He's been in full training for nearly, he, he said like nearly five months. But anyway, for, for quite a while, he's also put on size and weight. I've said my thoughts, but I would love to get your guys' thoughts. Ponga to six, good idea, bad idea. I think he's a better fullback than what he is a 5'8", obviously. I think that we have seen in the origin. I mean, if you look at Queensland, Caelan Ponga, mm. he's one of the best players in rugby league. He, he is arguably, outside of maybe Tom Dravojevic, the only player to outplay Tedesco in a game. Yeah. And that's and, and Tedesco still killed it, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and I mean, like, we just came out of that origin series this year. I think it was Paddy Carrigan, he got player of the series. KP should have got it. It should have been KP. Yeah, yeah. For me, KP. it was KP. Yeah, Paddy Carrigan was fantastic and mm. I would have had him on the podium, but KP was the best for me. Um, I, I just, I don't know, just because Newcastle haven't been able to get the best out of him at fullback, the move to 5'8 does confuse me. But I like it more that he's going to have Jackson Hastings as his halfback. Mm. I do like it more. I would still have him at fullback, but I like it more that they're going to have Hastings. Looks like Miller is going to land there, reportedly. So hopefully that does come through, because if not... <laughs> They're talking Tyson Gamble. Yeah, so Adam O'Brien said Tyson Gamble, Hodgson, and Dane Gagai as options for fullback, <sighs> which is like, what's, what's bizarre about that? And no disrespect to O'Brien, but it's like, so you moved an out and out six, like we all agree Tyson Gamble is a six, to the fullback position. I know there might be two other guys, but he's been names being tossed up, to the fullback position, and then you move a, an out and out fullback to the six position. Maybe it's a bit of smoke and mirrors and they are going to get Lockie Miller. If they do land Lockie Miller, I can understand it. I, I still am a bit iffy. Anyway, I'll get, I'll get to it. Timmy, what do you reckon, mate? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the first part of it is I just... I can't quite get my head around the fact that a bloke with a huge concussion history has been moved into the halves <laughs> where he'll make 20 tackles a game. Guru mentioned on the podcast a few weeks back that with the move, they're just going to send all their defence at, attack at him, opposition teams, who will make... We probably make 25 tackles a game. Minimum. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I don't like it for that reason. I think fullback is comfortably his best position. So I, essentially, I'm against the move, especially for that reason. We just said, like, they're short on fullbacks. Um, even, if, even if Lockie Miller gets confirmed, really good signing, but it was also the Sharks' third string fullback. Mm. It's like, well, is that going to be their solution? I don't know. <clears throat> the one thing I do like about it, and again, it's something that I've said on the podcast before. I don't think Newcastle use him uh, as effectively as they can in that he just he runs as that sweet runner like most fullbacks do, and, and that's fine. But where KP does most of his damage is where he's first receiver, he gets the ball flat and fast from a quick play of the ball, you get a retreating defensive line. Ten, he's too quick, he's too skillful. You cannot stop the bloke. It's amazing. Yeah, incredible. At 5'8", he will get, get more of an opportunity to play that role in attack, mm. and I think he will be electric. <laughs> That being said, he can also do that from fullback, so I don't mm. get it. Um, but that's one thing I'm excited to see. But as far as the move to six goes, I, I'm not a fan of it. Do you think they're thinking, and I've thought about this quite a lot, because like, we all agree he has the talent to make it all work, correct? Yeah. Well, like, if there's one, one guy that has a talent to go from fullback to six, he can do it. But the one thing that maybe from their angle is, mm. is like we've got this superstar that our team is built around. Do we pull him into the front line to give him more responsibility 
in key in a key position so that the choices that are made are made by him to a degree which is interesting because hastings is that usually that guy but whereas at fullback maybe he's just a bit away from the action again i, I personally would keep him at fullback i'm just trying to see from their perspective why they would move into six maybe they're thinking if we get him in at six it's going to increase the likelihood that he's going to direct us to where we where he wants us to go because he's closer to the ball and he can demand what, what needs to happen do you think that's their thinking Potentially, but at the same time, if you're going to sign Jackson Hastings as your halfback, you're giving him the keys. That's, that's. I mean, I, yeah, through yeah. it. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that, it's that, like, bizarre. If, you, if you're going to sign Jackson Hastings and not use him like that, what are you doing? Mm. That's where, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, he's going to be stuck down the corridor. I don't think he will be. I think you'll, they'll let Hastings play both sides of the ruck. And I, I think KP, I, I think it would be an unorthodox sort of 5'8", bit of a... A hybrid of a five-eight fullback. Like I, I still think that they'll allow him to play both sides of the ruck and float around. But <clears throat> is it necessary? I don't know. Is it necessary to drink my own urine, Gura? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do it anyway. <laughs> we all know that movie, correct? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank God. <laughs> thank God. I was like, I hope they know the fucking movie. One of the great oh. lines of the movie. I probably butchered the line, but we all get it. We all get it. <laughs> Um, thoughts to me on a yeah. drinking your own urine and what he just said. <laughs> yeah, look, you do as you please, mate. Okay. Um, I know I'm cool with that. What you do in your own time. But, um, <laughs> I think Guru's right. Uh, he'll play that both sides. Right, and I, I still think you can, you know, give Jacko the keys to the castle as a seven to, to run the show. And I think you're right, Kempi, in that mm. moving to the hearts, he will get more ball. He'll get more control over where where they're directing themselves in attack. And KP will just be swinging. As a 5'8", both sides of the rock. He won't be trapped in his left-hand corridor because, put it this way, if, he, if they play left and right side and KP plays just on the left side exclusively, Adam O'Brien doesn't deserve to coach more than five games this season because it would just be ridiculous, especially because they're moving him into the halves, we think, to get him more time on ball. And if you put him down and stick him on the left side, well, that defeats the purpose, doesn't yeah, it? So yeah. I think he'll swing, and I can see that working. And I said, Hastings will still run the show through the middle, but KP just going side to side. Essentially, by playing at 5'8", he's getting his hands on the ball one pass earlier because he's not having to wait for the half to hit the 5'8", for the 5'8 to hit him at fullback. So, mm. look, I think there's a lot of attacking upside to it that can really work. Mm. And I, I can't wait to see it. KP will kill it there. He'll kill it wherever he goes. He's one mm. of the best footballers in the NRL. Again, whether it's the best move for the team, I'm not convinced, but like there are massive upsides to him playing six. The other beauty of what they've done too is that, you know, yes, he'll be playing five eight, but because they've got um Adam Elliott, he'll normally be getting it three passes wide mm. as well, which is the other thing I really if they didn't have a lock forward like him, mm. completely <laughs> different conversation as mm. well. But I, I think he's gonna be one of the signings of the year, Adam Elliott. Oh, he's I'm a gun. He played so good him. at the Raiders. Um so just and quickly with KP, and again, this is me in defense of the New York Knights decision and trying to explain like why they would do it some may say why wouldn't he just get in attacking ball why wouldn't when he's heading into his 40 and they're attacking the line why wouldn't he just tell the six to move out to fullback but it's it kind of ruins the like for example that six he may not play really well as a fullback he may not have as good of a ball running or whatever but also it like ruins the flow of things of him stepping in and out of that role and so maybe the Knights have looked at tape and said, look what are the times our flow is ruined because, as you said, he'll, he'll get the ball one pass earlier, but I think he might even get the ball off the ruck a lot because a lot of his tries or, or his setups of tries are fast play the balls. He gets the ball one off the ruck and he, he attacks the line with speed with on the outside, mm. uh, with uh, help on the outside or line runners on the outside, uses his footwork to... to to break the line and so i wonder whether they're going to go the route of hastings gets us out of trouble so kicks gets the points in the field as soon as we get into that 40 kp just runs the team and that may be a way where you go okay now i get it you've got arguably you know we would assume he's the best footy knowledge even though hastings footy knowledge is, is crazy but he's attacking ability is the best in in the the team so maybe they're trying to say get our best attacking player with the ball as much as possible going into the line um in regards to is it the right call i still think i just i really think if he could play a full year at fullback you could get him back to the form of where we were questioning is he better than is he in more form better form than tedesco two or three years ago it's going to sound crazy but that was the question 
for a lot of people heading into Origin 1. Who's the better fullback, KP or Tedesco, <coughs> form-wise? Now, we all know Tedesco's career, is it speaks for itself. So I would have loved to see him play at fullback. I, I think he's he can be an incredible fullback. I am also concerned in regards to the front line, the amount of traffic that's going to be going down his way. What I do like is you've already seen a physical response from him. He's trying to put on weight. He's doing all the right things. So he's doing all the right things in his control that he can, can do. Uh, it's just going to be really interesting to see. I mean, is it a hail Mary for Adam O'Brien? Because now it truly is, if this doesn't work, you, like it takes balls. Because he the safe thing for Adam O'Brien would have been like, you stay fullback, bro. Because if I move you to six and we lose our first whatever games, like, pff, I'm Gonskis. Um, and, and I, you know, you never want to wish anyone to not lose, to, to lose their job. But unfortunately, the Knights are in a position where he's under pressure. Um, I, I still think that he should be given a fair crack, for sure. But he is under pressure. He's, you know, Hook's under pressure. Kevin Walters is probably under pressure. Um, they're quite, like, so there's a group of them that are under pressure. Anyway. <clears throat> but yeah, it looks to me like it is a... You know, a bit of a last gasp from Adam O'Brien. Say, oh, something needs to change. What can we do? But like, are we overthinking it in terms of the move to 5'8"? This bloke, I know I've gone on about it, so sorry, but concussion after concussion <coughs> after concussion, you make three tackles at fullback, you guys make 25 in the front line. Mm. It just seems bleedingly obvious that that is not a smart move mm. when you try and protect this bloke's head. And, you know, he's one, you know he might be one bad concussion away from missing the first half of the season. Yeah. Not, it, say, not saying that can't happen at fullback. Like he's yeah. had a stack of concussions at fullback. So maybe they're thinking, you know what, he gets them there, he'll get them in the front line, whatever. But All right. Just what, what about this? If he plays a full year and he's injury free, and touch wood, we all hope KP stays injury free because like, he's incredible. So, so good for the game. If he stays injury free for the whole year, would it be a success in regards to do you think that increases the likelihood that he makes a transition? I, I think if he can stay injury free and Hastings can stay injury free, I think it can be a success. Yeah, I okay. really do. And I hear a lot of people say, <laughs> "Oh, it didn't work with Mitchell Pierce a couple of years ago. It's not going to work now." It's like it's it's such a stupid comment to make because KP was such a different player three years ago. Oh yeah, completely. Like guys don't say the same. That they, they develop. Well, he's they a club leader now. Change. Yeah, like he's a complete. Like he wouldn't have been able to do what he did in Origin last year three years ago. Mm. He's a completely different footballer. So I, I just I, when I hear that comment, I think you're comparing. Apples and oranges. Mm. It's it's completely irrelevant. I, I I think that if he stays injury free, which I think is their biggest challenge by far and away. And, and also, to, just to be clear too, Pierce is a way different player to Hastings. Heaps different. Hastings yeah. is so structured. It's whereas Pierce was almost a six, like a ball runner to, to a degree. And uh, you got to remember too, like when they made this change too. What what year was that? Was it eighteen, nineteen? Nineteen. Nineteen. Yeah. So different coach too. Yeah, different coach. There's. Different forward pack, like uh, like a lot has been moved in and matured since then. Adam Elliott obviously comes in. He may really be able to relieve a bit of pressure. Look, I'm, I am, as I said, if I was a coach, I would have kept him at fullback, but I'm absolutely hoping it works. And if there is a guy that has the talent to make it work, it's KP. It, the, two th the only two things are, is his team going to put him in a position to play really well? Because he could be the best six in the world. If his forward pack get dominated, it doesn't matter. And two... He's just handling the defense, and that, that's really it. I mean, I know, I know he's brave enough. He's almost too brave. Like, he, so he'll he'll that's get the into problem. The, yeah, yeah. He's too brave, so he'll get into the contact. There won't be any worry about him being willing to get into contact. What do you got there, Matty? Just to add to the comments of like the it didn't work a few years ago, which it didn't. But he only played three games before they turfed him. He was back in fullback in round four. Like, yeah, that's not enough time. That. That's not even a month. Even Lockie is first, and I, and <clears throat> Lockie is different because he was already the greatest fullback arguably of all time at the time and then made his move and he had a team around him that was insane but even Lockie's first few games took him a little bit to get yeah, used the, to the transition wasn't as perfect as what we remember with Lockie because he nah, turned out no he way. took time he, he got peppered with his defence yep. everyone said he couldn't defend and to be fair initially he did struggle in defence um, do you think it's one of those things though that you made the decision. You got to stick with it now. There's no dropping him five back to fullback after five games. It's until at least Origin for me. <coughs> yeah, at least. What do you reckon, Timmy? Yeah, I think you need to give him the first, you know, probably eight to ten rounds. You mm. can't just have said turf the idea after three or four rounds because what's the point of it in the first place? Um, the other thing that we're sort of looking at attack and hands on ball and all this sort of thing, but we're also overlooking sort of how good a role he plays in defence at fullback, where his kick defusals are unbelievable. His positioning is outstanding. Mm. You know, his kick returns and ability to, to beat one-on-one -on -one tackles and get a quick play ball and get the set off to a good start, all, all of that. And then as a result of this, you're getting, you know, 
as it stands, it might be a makeshift fullback to start the season. At fullback. If it's Lockie Miller, Yeti, a bloke who's done a bit of ball play but not a lot, him into fullback. Um, what about the defensive <coughs> attributes he has at fullback that they now won't have? And that's not saying Lockie Miller can't do it or maybe mm. Bailey Hodgson, but you're taking a proven bloke, one of the best in the game at it, and getting rid of that. And, and when you game. say defensively, you're talking about like organising the line. You're not talking about actual. Yeah, all, all that organising the defensive line. He's yeah. taught from fullback. He so his of bombs. bomb defusals yeah. are yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, he would. Him getting up sometimes was so dangerous because he'd get yeah. up like horizontal nearly. Uh, no, I agree. It's going to be interesting to see how they replace that. Um, now, Lockie Miller. More whispers have surfaced in regards to him getting signed to the Knights. Is this the right call for the Newey Knights? I think so. Yeah. I mean. We'll talk about him later, but there's a kid from the Gold Coast that I would have reached out to in the last yep. 48 hours. Which may put sure. pressure on that happening if you're Lockie Miller's manager. Um, Timmy, what do you reckon? Right call, Lockie Miller, wrong call? They need it. Yeah. They don't have a fullback, so... Well, apparently Hodgson is, is earmarked and he's a young mm. fellow. And we spoke about him a, a few weeks ago and we said, look, I haven't really heard buzz around him, so that's, that's concerning. But, Guru, you found out that he'd been injured? Yeah, he had a few injuries last year and whatnot. But, I mean, even when guys are injured... You still hear buzz about, mm. and also like even if he is the greatest player of all time, like until you play first grade, you're not going to bank your season on a bloke that hasn't debuted yet. Yeah, I think as you said before, you know if they start poorly, it could be chaos. Mm. Respectfully to these other teams, the Knights might have the perfect start. They play the Warriors and the Tigers, who were 16th and 15th last year, mm. into the Dolphins. <sighs> If they get off to a 3-0 you know, start, the confidence that will do for that team. I mean, it might be exactly what they need for their year, you know, that just confidence. Yeah, and then they have Canberra, Manly, and the Warriors. Which is doable. Well, like I mean, in, they're they, both good sides, but... The Raiders are the only top eight side they play in the first six weeks from yeah. last year. So, so I mean, it, it's... And they play them at home on a Sunday afternoon. It's almost a perfect start to get things going again for the club. Um, Matty? It looks like, I'm just reading it here, the reason it's A, going to take a couple of weeks to finalise, and B, we've been talking about Lockie Miller for months now to the Knights. It looks like the Sharks want someone in return as a player, player swap, and they're unable, they're, like, they're struggling to like find a deal right now, and that's why it's taking so long. So it'll be yeah. interesting to see if anyone from Newcastle actually ends up a Cronulla. Because like, the interesting about the people are like, why would they want a player swap? Because like he's, he's a player that is on not that much money, rah, rah, but it's all about roster management. Like... Yep. They need another, if they lose Lockie Miller, they need another outside back. Otherwise, they've lost Metcalf. Lost Metcalf as well. Then, how important did guys like Connor Tracy, Lockie Miller, how important were they last year to him? Um, and also, the Knights are offering three years. He's 28. He's, you know, this, he only started playing rugby league. And basically last year. guaranteeing a fullback position. Yeah. So, it's, he'll obviously want to go. I think, mm. yeah, it's just all the behind the scenes stuff that's stored yeah, at okay. the moment. I mean, it shows you what a strong position that the Sharks are in. Like, yesteryear, they're not even considering getting rid of a guy. Like, not getting rid of, but you understand what I'm saying. We were sitting here this morning and, you know, just talking about the potential the Sharks might want to play a swap. And we sort of said, oh, who, who would they take? And we went through the Sharks' side. There's no fucking holes in it. They've got depth everywhere. <laughs> They've got a, such a good oh, I side. honestly don't know who they'd ask for that would be a reasonably fair swap mm. for a Lockie Miller. I, well, we saw the – like, Lockie Miller ran for, like, 250 metres on his debut and had, like, eight tackle breaks. And then he continued to play – Really well, you know, so... Who's the backup hooker at the Sharks at the moment behind Brayley? Well, Beryl. they got rid of Randall. And they've... Who? Oh, sorry, did, did you, you say, say Sharks or... Yeah, yeah Beryl. Beryl. So yeah. They, they don't need a hooker. And they've got McInnes if they need to and he, as well. Beryl so was, they don't need anything. The listeners, they? Beryl was literally the best Q Cup hooker mm. two years ago. Yeah. And then he obviously went down to New South Wales Cup. I was saying to Matty, like, when you have a look at that Sharks side, like, there's so much depth. I would honestly think I'd go for Kurt Mann. Just get someone that covers fucking everything. Mm. Yeah, I agree, actually. But there's no way not to get rid of Kurt Mann. Holy shit. Means you get a fullback though, maybe. I mean, if they're looking at Tyson Gamble and Dane Gagai, that's you. Yeah, actually, you know what? You're right. When you think, and you go, okay, well, all right, we lose Kurt Mann at 14, but then we can chuck in Gamble at 14. He's actually a really fucking good 14. Uh, I mean, respectfully to Newcastle, and you know, like they've never been able to get the best out of Kurt Mann. Mm. It's been five <coughs> years. They don't. He's know had his periods, I think. Though he's had great periods, yeah. but what position does he play? Yeah. It's, yeah. And if I'm going to be a 14, I think I'd rather be a 14 at the Sharks. He'd be a fucking great 14. Be gun for uh, Yeah, so, look, interesting times for the New England Knights. Look, you've got to give Adam O'Brien credit, though. Like, this is a fucking huge call. Like, mm. when you're already under pressure, a lot of people would go, I'm going the safe route. I'm under the pump right now if I lose this amount of games. But he, he's going the, no, nah, I'm going to put everything on the line and see how it goes. So I give Adam O'Brien credit for that. And as I said, like, 
I want the Knights to go well. They're definitely a side that the NRL needs to go well because their fans, arguably the most loyal in the competition. That, that, you'd have to say they're one of the most, well, they are one of the most light teams in the competition, if not the most like neutral to yep. other fans. Like, there aren't too many people out there death ride in the Newcastle. Nah, fans. and I, I think that has a lot to do with like the Joey era. Mm. They were just so loved. And then, you know, the Newcastle people, they just turn out. Like they'll be, they'll be wooden spoon. Yeah. Those years where they were wooden spoon, they were still getting like, some of the highest averages in the fucking comp. Yeah. Mm. So the fans, absolutely, hopefully they can get uh, some playing some good footy. Um, <clears throat> or, I mean, we've got to talk about it quickly. Uh, Pong has sustained a calf injury and is in doubt for all stars. Um, I mean, look, we have to talk about it. That is concerning. Like he has had soft tissue injuries before, already getting injured. It may just be a little calf strain. It's not the end of the world, but it's something to note of like, ooh. That's not what you want. Yeah, for me, I think it's more important that they're going into this season with a new halfback, a new 5'8". It's going to be a new fullback. Um, and they're missing their 5'8", their star player, for their entire preseason. I think that's probably the biggest impact of this. Uh, I did the same thing, mate. I've you know, I've been looking at all these photos of KP over the last few weeks going, fuck, he's put on size. It's fucking big. He looks huge. And when I saw this, I went, oh, fuck, okay. Yeah. What well, can his legs handle? I spoke to um, NRL Physio last night about it to get a non-pleb opinion. And he sort of <laughs> said, oh... It's not as concerning as it seems. Okay. Um, he's he's still well and truly more concerned about concussions by yeah, far well, and away. That's interesting. So, that's really interesting. Okay, well, I mean, good news on, on the injury front. And uh, it's at NRL Physio, guys. Fucking the best in the business for injuries. Best in the business. Um, now, some Titan rumours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. So the career mail, <clears throat> and so the career mail is usually pretty bang on. The career mail is reporting that AJ, uh, as in, sorry, I apologise. The career mail usually has a better insight into the Queensland sides. The bang on bit, I don't have enough information to judge Pe it. Was it Peter Bedell who wrote it? Yeah, yeah, it's Peter Bedell, Bedell who's, who's usually pretty. So he pretty is, on. is quite. If he gets mail, it's either been in. Yeah, anyway, he. Very good journo. He's got insight into the Queensland clubs. Mm. Like, probably the best insight of any journo for the Queensland clubs. Would that be yeah, fair to say? I'd say for sure. Um, so, I'm not saying this is like take it to the bank, but it's, you know, he's a pretty good source. Yeah. For, for the skeptics out there, he hasn't made it up for the sake of a story. He, he, he wouldn't, he most likely <laughs> wouldn't have done that. So, I don't know about the rest of your email. I'm just saying about this specifically. AJ Brimson to play fullback. Foran will play six. Tanner Boyd will play halfback. And Jaden Campbell looks set to play 14 in a super sub role. Now, if you recall, and you're a loyal listener, which I'm sure you are, a couple of years ago, the whole issue of losing Fogarty was before the season had started, they came out and said, uh, Sexton is going to be a half next year. And they ended up losing Fogarty because Fogarty obviously is sitting there going, well, I want to play in a role. I'm getting older. I'm not getting any younger. Then they come out at the start of this, the season that has just went before any ball had been kicked. I think it was even before preseason or at least mid preseason. And you mean the great Gurino, we uh, couldn't understand it and came out and said, Aaron Clark is absolutely the number nine. And we were sitting there going, why would you publicly come out and say that? It just, all it does is reduce the amount of options you have rather than increase them. If you want to say it, say it internally. Anyway, that Aaron Clark eventually by the end of the year, at the start of the year, we all both agreed. We thought Aaron Clark was more of a 13, not a nine. They ended up getting him in his position and he played incredibly well at 13. Now they've come out and the report is, is they're already set on their halves pairings. Thoughts on this situation, Guru? I don't know why the Titans do this to themselves. I, what, what is the point of coming out and announcing who's going to play what decision, what, what position in or at least in January? Giving enough to Peter Bedell for it to be a story. It's wild. Like the New Zealand Warriors did the same thing a few weeks ago. It, it was in December and they came out and said what their spine was going to be. Mm. I don't, what, like you've got trials to come your way. You've got an entire preseason. Not everyone's back yet. I don't understand why you'd be, why they hand out jerseys this early. Because mm. what it does is you get to round one, you go through your trials, someone has a good off-season and they're ready to take that jersey and then you look like a fucking mug. Mm. So they've got to stick with it, which is why I think Aaron Clark played so much hooker last year. Because mm. it would have looked stupid on the Titans to then back out of it after a few weeks. If they would have, though, it could have been a completely different season. And also, you disappoint the competitors for the spot. So if I'm a seven, whether it's Sexton, whoever it is, 
And and then I see that, I'm going, you get disheartened. You're like, oh, well, I don't even have a fucking chance. Like, I, I may as well just focus on being the, the resis for now. Now, some might say, oh, come on, you're a professional athlete. You should always be pushing. Yeah, but they're human beings as well. They're going to get disappointed, especially a guy like Sexton, who, like, he wasn't the reason for their woes last year at all. He, he did some some decent stuff. Um, this is what we spoke about at the start of last year, that Toby <coughs> Sexton was in so much danger. They limped into the finals the year before and everyone everyone had them as a top eight team, which was fucking ridiculous. This kid was the future. Now he's not in the team yeah. 12 months later. And we're not even talking about him. I guarantee you people will want to see young Tom Weaver before they see Toby Sexton again. And what's crazy about it is the guy that he leapfrogged last year, Tanner Boyd, who's been at the club for like four or five years now, is in the team. So many people out there genuinely think Tanner Boyd is a hooker that's having a go at halfback. Oh, no. He's Australia. always been a halfback. He has grown up standing next to a feeder. We said this time and time again last year. You don't know what to do with your halves. you got his best mate there who's always played alongside him at school, club, rep, Australian schoolboys. Give him a shot to play his position. The moment they decide to give him that chance is when they sign Kieran Foran. <laughs> it's bizarre. It's, it doesn't make sense. The more me. you think about it, the less it makes sense. What do you reckon about this uh, report? Again, not saying it's to the bank, but... You know, this form. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, coming out early and, and even chatting about it and trying to lock in and say Tarn's the front runner just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. A lot of thoughts about the 167 14 makeup. What's your take on it? Are you happy with I'm just, just curious to get it. No, no, I, I, I would have gone four and at seven, Brimo at six, mm. Campbell at fullback, and that would have been my. And you were the same. Yeah, and it, like if they were going to do this, why the fuck did you play Brimo at fullback all at five eight all last year? Mm. Like, is there no? Are they not planning for the future at all here? Mm. It's it's interesting now. So, what what would have been your spine? I'm a little more on the fence, and I thought you both might say Campbell at, at fullback. I, I get the direction they're going, and I love Brimo at fullback. Um, you know, we we talk about planning to the future, and, and you. No matter which way you go, you're sort of stunting your future and also planning for your future yeah. because that's all based on, like, how badly do you want Jaden Campbell at this club? Yeah. I think Brimson's best position is fullback and he's so good there. He's, so he's good. quite good defensively there. Um, Jaden Campbell is a, you know, a potential star, I should say. He's not a star yet, but he's a very small body at fullback, which has its issues. So I do like Brimo at fullback. Um, you, when you look at, like, Tarner Boyd can still be their future. He can be the oh, Titans. Oh, for sure. He can be the Titans. You know, Chad Towns. I thought he had some great games at the end of last year. Exactly. So, so that's where I'm kind of like, you know what? I'm happy for them to say, Tana, come in and you get the first six to ten rounds, whatever it might be. Learn underneath Kieran Foran. Um, again, being that sort of negative view at it, but Foz is getting old age in the back end of his career, big injury history. If he goes down, you know, Tana can be the bloke to sort of lead the show there. Mm. I don't mind the way they, they've gone about it, and I don't actually mind the one six seven. Uh, Jaden Campbell at 14, I don't know how that works. And mm. obviously that's the report. Whether or not he actually runs out as their 14 to start the year, I'm not so sure they would if he does miss the starting team. Mm. Because where does he come on? Like, so they ran him small. there for a little bit He's last too year. small to yeah. be in the starting line. You don't really want to shift Brimo at the 60th minute into yeah. the starting line, like mm. front line, I should say. Yeah, no, you're right. It's, it's I mean, you could just say, well go out there and rip and tear and maybe Brimo defends for 10 minutes in the front maybe. line or something. Um, so so basically, you don't understand why they would publicly come out and say it, but privately, you like that makeup. Of, I don't mind it, yeah. yeah. I, I can see it, and I can see it working. I mm. can see, I'm a bit like you boys, I, I like Tarnder Boys as a football. I think he'll be a good halfback. He'll learn a lot this season, probably has already in the preseason off, off Kieran Four. And so mm. I think that makeup can work. It keeps Brimo in his best position. Mm. If Tarner Boyd hits the ground running, and he doesn't have to be a star next to Foz because Foz will help him with all the organisation so much, <laughs> I think there's the makings of a really good halves pairing mm. there. Yeah, I, I don't mind that spine at all. Mm. It's just the public. Like, why do we need to That's know ridiculous. about it? Yeah, like, silly. I don't, I don't, like, why are you even speaking to journos about someone being locked in for certain positions? Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm a fan of Tanner for sure. And, and for all the reasons you just suggested, I still probably would start with Foz there. Remo, because I'm I'm bi big fan of Campbell. Like I'm scared of the club losing him. Mm. Maddie, what do you got there? I thought Campbell was going to be fullback as well, and the report did shock me. But there's one thing I really, really like about it, and unfortunately, Campbell's going to be sacrificed here. And this is just one scenario. But 
I just hated the fact that if Campbell got injured, then their whole spine was going to be reshuffled. They were yeah. going to move Brimson from six to fullback if Campbell got injured. Like, that doesn't sit well with me. I'd rather them all... I'd rather, like, the plan is... I remember you asking that question yeah, maybe in the review a few A few weeks ago, yeah, yeah, whatever. So I'm just glad that... Stability? Yeah, it's a bit more, bit more stable. So that's the one thing I do like about it. Unfortunately, Campbell is a loser, and he probably I would look for another club and start at fullback somewhere. But... Yeah, that's the one thing I do like about this spine. Okay, so we have to ask the question then. Do the Titans lose a guy like Campbell? And where would he go? If you were, if you were to, if you would look at clubs that would, could use a guy like Campbell, where would you like to see him go? Now, we've spoken a little bit about it. Like, for example, you look at the Storm and you go, okay, Ryan Pappenhausen. Now, we all want Ryan Pappenhausen to get back to his best. We ups this fuck. So incredible. But the reality is you still have to look to the future and just be like what if what if is that an option could campbell be a guy that if they see how pappy goes and you know i, I think pappy makes a full recovery guys i'm just saying these are the questions as a club you probably have to ask yourself yeah and i think there's a number of i mean when you you've spoken about it for a long time you've been one of his bigger fans you watch Jaden campbell and you know he might be a little bit small or whatever but his touches his balance crazy the things that you it's hard to put into words they're off the fucking charts with mm. this kid. He is incredible. And that's, you know, in a Titan system, if you were to bring him to, you know, one, one of the other, you know, it's teams or systems or whatever that are, that, that historically do a little bit better with, with their development, he could be scary. I mean, if you're the Canterbury Bulldogs and you can get a Stephen Crichton at, who hasn't played much fullback in first grade, or you can get Jaden Campbell, mm. That's an interesting conversation. Be much cheaper. Be it. The value, I reckon, would, would favour Jaden Campbell. Mm. Experience and everything. Full Stephen Crichton, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but there's a number of teams that I think could be having a serious look at him. If he's not playing fullback, do we think he could play anywhere else? Like, I think he's a fullback out and out fullback. He's yeah. too small to play anywhere but fullback. Mm. You can't defend him in the front line. Yeah. Look, you could make the argument Preston played a bit of uh, six at yeah. times. Even nine at times, didn't he? Um, but maybe game, the games no. changed. Yeah, maybe I the games that. changed quite a lot since then. I could be again. I'm just throwing the devil's, devil's advocate out there. Is there? Do you think the Titans lose a guy like Campbell because of this situation? Probably him or Toby Sexton. You know, one of them probably has to go. I think Sexton, like, like it's easy to say because he wants to play in a role. But Sexton, be patient. Yeah. I think. and I suppose even if Boyd does kill it in the halves and Sexton. Has to wait a little bit longer. You're still probably sitting there going, you know what, Foz isn't going to be it's around. It's 12 forever. to 24 months, Max. You know. So, anyway. yeah, I think so. And in terms of clubs, wise, if it is Jaden Campbell, the <coughs> one to go, uh, Guru nailed it. You mentioned the Knights earlier, who mm. looks a great fit, but the Doggies. The Doggies would be an awesome fit for him. Yeah, the Doggies, the Knights would be really interesting. I'd be surprised if the Knights aren't giving this bloke a call. Just on Boyd, and you all know I'm a fan of him. I was talking about him all last year, but. You have a look at the end of last season when he did play halfback. He played five games at halfback at the end of the season. They got beat by the Melbourne Storm. Mm. Played Manly at home, who you'll remember were in fucking free fall. Mm. Played the St. George of the Dragons. Got beat by 20-odd points there. Beat the Knights, who were also in all sorts. And then their final game of the season, uh, they beat the Warriors over there, their last game before all this stuff's mm. over. So I just... I just hope the Titans, and I said it last year about Toby Sexton, and they're obviously not running with him anymore. I just hope that if they go with Boyd at seven, it has to be a long-term thing. Yeah, long-term plan. You learn, like, halfbacks develop over years, not over weeks. Mm. You have to stick with these guys. <coughs> so if, if Tanner Boyd's going to be the guy with Kieran Foran, that's fine. But, mate, I'd be more than happy to have a little wager on Tom Weaver being the halfback round one next year. Yeah, wow. I know there's not much... Between the two, but would you have preferred Sexton or Boyd as the seven to start the season? This season? Yeah. Pro probably Boyd. I've always liked Boyd. I never thought he was a hooker. Mm. Um, but I, I'd rather you pick one of them and pick him for two years. Do you think a key issue at the Titans at the moment is their development of players? Like, you know, the choice to, like, play Tanner Boyd essentially at nine for, what, three years now? At least two. Two. At least yeah. two. And it's like, how has that helped his seven you know development and what's the one question they've been asking for that entire who how do we get the best out of a feeder yeah maybe you go to the guy that's played with him more than anyone throughout mm -hmm. his entire fucking life you've got your cold but you're playing out of position which, then, which is interesting as well because and this is a big super coach point of interest but it was we've spoke about dave for playing left side outside foz um 
could Foz be the bloke to unlock Dave Fafita? So now, if this is the team that runs out, it looks like he'll partner with Tanner Boyd on the right. Mm. Both for Fermor stays on the left. Uh, initially, again, probably selfishly from a super coach perspective, I was like, get Fifi outside <laughs> Foz. I wanted to see it. Yeah. But the more I think about it, I think it makes a lot of sense to put Fafita, almost regardless of who the right edge half is, on the right. Because you look at Kieran Foran and what he does well is he plays so direct and he opens up the space for that good, hard line running back rower, mm. which is Bo Fermor. Yeah. It's not Dave Fafita. Yeah. Dave Fafita gets early ball, he skips, he belts people, he's got the big right hand fend. Um, you know, would Dave Fafita have run those hard lines for Foz? No doubt he would have got plenty out of him. Mm. But for the balance of that team, I actually think probably Fafita playing on the right outside Boyd, who he knows his game, he'll get him early ball, he'll give him what he needs. Um, I like it. Mm. I'm still, I know um, people don't like it. Oh, well, no, they not, don't like it. I still think it, there's a chance just to consider <laughs> putting Dave Fafita in the middle and just getting a fucking, I need 21s out of your bra and then we'll get you off. Now, look, I know that might be stupid because he's so destructive on the edge, but I'm just trying to get, if they struggle for the first five to 10 games getting him involved again, I think you, you have to put him in the middle there and just say, run it, bro. Like, there was a game at the end of last year, was it maybe against the Raiders, where he actually swapped edges at half time. Mm. Like, they're mm. clutching, surely. They, they just, I think they just need to keep it as simple as they can. You look at the Titans' start to the season, they got the Tigers and the Dragons mm. to start. Not too bad. Um, hopefully they can win one or two of those games. If they don't, though, they then go Melbourne, Cowboys, into a fucking bye. Two weeks to overthink everything. Oh, fuck. Tough start. Tough start. Um, so, yeah, I just just to be clear with the people listening, we're not saying that the Tanner decision is a bad decision at all. We think he's a good player. I still probably would go the initial one, what I was saying. It's just more the fact that we shouldn't, they shouldn't be confirming things publicly again. Like, keep, give yourself options, keep it private. You don't usually hear that out of the best clubs. Like, you know, we're sticking with this or we're sticking with that. Um, now, I know people might say, oh, well, Wayne Bennett does that all the time, but he doesn't do it publicly. Usually it's quite private that he gives people an, the tap on the shoulder and says, you've got that position. Um, but I hope that the Titans, is Holbrook under pressure if I the first round? I think so. Yeah? yeah. Timmy? Big time. Big, big under pressure? Yeah. What do you reckon, Maddie? Holbrook under pressure? Yeah, I think so. I think he's one of probably three that are under mm. pressure. I think probably Anthony Griffin the most, but yeah. If, if you go on glass half full with the Titans, all they need to do is fix their defense. That's it. And they're, they're fighting for the eight. I don't know if they'll be top six or whatever, but if they fix their defense, look what the Sharks did. Their defense was, you know, not the best. And then Fitzgibbon came in, they improved their defense, came second. And yet like, their, their defense last year was one of the... I th I'm, I, I'm sorry if I'm mixing up the defense and attack, but I'm pretty sure the defense before Fitzgibbon there was one of the worst. Not, not that great. Let's just put it that way. And then obviously now they're second. We'll say, I'm just looking... Tanner Boy did finish the year at halfback last year and they did win three of their last four games. They were against bottom eight teams. Yeah, but, well, like, that, there. but that's what we're saying though. Yeah. We, we're fans of Tanner yeah. and we thought he played well last year. It's just like, again, this publicity oh. around key positions... Uh, may not be there. But anyway, uh, w what I will say is, is that this is the best position the Titans have been in roster-wise in, what do you reckon, four or five uh, years? Yeah, probably more than that, I'd say. Yeah? yeah a long time, yes. They've got an out-and-out -out hooker. They've got an out-and-out -out six. You know, Tanner is a seven. And they've got an out-and-out -out fullback. Yeah, and, well, and the dummy arse one we haven't spoken about much Fuck, I think he could be a tremendous signing, mm. Sam Verrills. I love everything about him. Yeah, so do I. I think, he'll be, I, I think he will be a good signing. A good and, signing. And as we said, again, we spoke about it in depth a little bit in the previews, but they've signed to fix their problem, and that's been defence yep. amongst a number of positions, and yep. Verrills is at the heart of that. Foz is another one. So there's no reason why they can't be big improvers. For sure. And so giving Titans credit and the ad, like admin, they've clearly identified the issues. And they're trying to fix it. So they're doing all the right things outside of their little, um, you know, publicly releasing the spine or whatever. And, and the other thing, we're sitting here going, um, Toby Sexton's missed a spot. Jaden Campbell's missed a spot. The other young gun half coming through the ranks. Yeah. Like, depth is good in key positions. Yeah. Even in their, their outside backs, it's, it's decent. They've mm -hmm. got, Mar oh, Marzi, sorry, just recently left. But they've got, like, with bringing shop in, they've still got... Um, Oh, I always forget his Brian name. Brian Kelly, Sammy. I've got a lot Brian of Kelly, it. Sammy, but there's Herbert. Herbert yeah. as well. Like, these guys are fucking... 
when they play well and they saw their defence, they're fucking good outside backs. Uh, so it's not all doom and gloom for the Titans at all. Uh, I actually think they're in one of the best positions they've been in a long time. Um, it's just more about the public coming out and saying, you know, this is what's happening. Uh, or at least telling it to a journal and then them reporting it. Uh, now, so a former club legend. This is, this is a, just a, a bit of a nothing thing because it's just like a club legend has basically said that Manly, the quote is this. Uh, if if uh, if if Tommy Tavoyevich can't come back and you know play full seasons, the quote is this: Yes, I would release him to a rival. This guy's name is Peter Peters. He's a former club player. I think it's a business decision. He may not. He may have to take ill and retire if it if it keeps going. He's played 121 games and he's made his debut back in 2015. It's just not enough games. He's a superstar, but it's like having a Lamborghini full of petrol in the garage, but you can't drive because mechanically it's not sound. And then he said it may be that they should play him at centre. Um, with stuff like this, it's like, it. I can understand, like, as a Manly fan, you're like, bro, this just puts more pressure on on Tommy as, as a former club player coming out and saying this. But maybe he was just asked a question and that's just his honest opinion. Look, even though I think Tommy will be able to come back and, and I, I hope anyway, make a full recovery, I'm sure they've got to begin to look at, like, the, the worst case scenario. And you'd want any club to look at the worst case scenario, surely. Yeah, I, I think this is a bit of a storm and a teacup, to be honest with you. I mean, um, Zorba's obviously been in media for a number of years and whatnot, but <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of media outlets that have just been waiting for someone to say something like this, mm. dive on it. It's mm. going to, you know, the headlines are going to be huge of it. I don't I don't think it will affect Seabold's, Turbo's mindset in any way, shape or form. I don't. Timmy? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think it's, a, as um, Guru said, possibly a little blown out of proportion a little bit, but... I think if we're looking down the track and there's more injuries and you actually you get to the point where you're going, we're giving this bloke a million dollars a season, of course you have to make some tough calls. Mm. I would like to think by that point, in let's say two years' time, if these injuries start, keep coming and Tommy's getting towards the end of current contract and they're looking at the future, and I might be wrong in saying this, but I feel like Tommy would be more willing to take a pay cut to stay loyal to them through his injuries all these years on a million bucks a year before it got to the point of... We're releasing you to go to another club. So mm. it wouldn't be big. Like it's Tom Trebojevic. But let's say he keeps getting injured. You know, maybe they go, all right, we'll give you 700k a year rather than taking up one or 1.1 1. 1 mil if you have a cap, which people, teams will take gambles on with Tom Trebojevic even two years down the chat because he's Tom Trebojevic. But, you know, by that point, Tommy should be doing all right in the back pocket and maybe he'd take a bit of a cut to say, you know what, I need to give a bit back to you boys, you, you club, I should say, for all these injuries. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, if, this, if it is the case that he can't get on the field or whatever, I can't see Tommy going, nah, nah, I'm not. And also, you're right, there is so many other clubs that would take a punt on him and believe and trust in their rehab facilities yeah. and the way they take care of their players to get the best out of him. Um, I think Tommy bounced back, I, I, re I really do. I think he bounces back. I also think, you know, you have to remember, I think, and I understand why it's quite dramatic at the moment. Like, I understand it, he's done his homie so many times, totally get it. But he will be supposedly ready for round one, you know. So it's not like he's missed any games yet. So, um, like, I, I, I don't think it will affect Seabold or anything like that, but it's just like added noise that they probably yeah. didn't need. But in the defense of uh, Peter, you know, I'm sure, I mean, you have to balance your cap. Like, you have to be having all these conversations. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go through with it and that's going to happen. But you have to be wary of that, like, He's your main signing, your superstar signing on the biggest money. Um, what's what's the worst case scenario plan? But Tommy is such a, you've already alluded to it, Timmy. He is such a manly through and through bloke. There's no way he's not going to be willing to come to the table and work with the club because he wants the club to win comps. He wants to win premierships with that club. So I don't think, it, I personally don't think it'll ever get to the stage where they can't mutually just talk it out. I don't think it's going to, put pressure on the club in future years in regards to, I would be very surprised if we started seeing these huge crazy articles of Tom Dvojevic against Manly. It, that, that would be really disappointing and yeah. I don't think it will happen. And that's the biggest thing in Manly's corner, you know, when, you, when they sign a player, they're a Manly player. Tom's a Manly guy, oh. always has been. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest thing they've got in their corner and if this situation was different where, you know, if they were in, you know, the situation that, that's an example, um, the Knights, for example, they signed KP from North Queensland, from New Zealand. Yeah. It's a little bit different. Mm. But because Tom has grown up there, you know, like we've spoken about a number of times in this podcast, 
he's the guy going down to Monaval to do the fucking barbecue yeah, on a Sunday sure. morning. Like it's a it's a huge thing to have in their corner. And I, I agree with everything that Tim said. Oh, I think it will play into their favour a lot over the next few yeah, years. And the other thing is, like, yeah, yeah you give him a million dollars a year, which he obviously deserves, and you need results on field. You need him being there, but like you've got to look at what doesn't come into that on-field contract, what he does for them off the field and how, like, what's immeasurable in in dollars. Mm. He's the face of this club. Yeah. And so, yeah, he might be worth a million dollars as a football player, but what's he worth to the club outside of it? Well, put it this way, and, and this is just, uh, this is, I don't have the full facts to back this up, but I can only assume. I'm pretty sure 2022, what was the first game? Thursday night? Manly versus someone? And I think it had a lot to do with Tom Travojevic's incredible season and being one of the biggest superstars. You put your biggest games on Thursday and Friday. And so Manly got that first game yep. because of Tom Travojevic. That's how valuable, and again, this is an assumption, but it's, I think it's correct. Mm. That's how much revenue this bloke generates. That, yeah, you're right. That sparked a memory. I don't have the exact number in front of me. I think they jumped from like, I think they doubled their primetime games last year because of Tommy's 2021 yeah. season for that exact reason. You know reason. how much fucking money that is? That is millions and millions of dollars. And so obviously you want to win comps or whatever, but you're right. That's a whole factor. You put it this way. There is a large, because fans have changed a little bit, not, not heaps, but if people, let's say they did start treating Tommy poorly because he wasn't playing and he was trying to play, but they were angry and they're trying to get rid of him. And right, just a typical footy stuff. There's a lot of fans that would hate the club for that because yeah. he's so loved at Manly um anyway so I, I, th I just thought it was good to bring up because i know that would uh, there may be some manly fans that that kind of when they see an ex-player talking about that I mean, put it this way i understood how broncos fans when they saw ex-players come out during that whole time and it'll just be a bit stressful as a fan you're like oh fuck like what's what's happening i think tom trovich's relationship with manly is like blue like super like super good i think he'd be more than willing to talk about anything that needs to be talked about I don't think there's any stress between a division coming at, at the moment. I hope that, you know, that doesn't change. I saw but. during the preseason, Harley Smith Shield, the Raiders outside back, he, his brother donated some of his hamstring to him. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's crazy. Yeah. Tell, so tell us, so, so Harley Smith Shields did his hammy last year. And basically he needed someone with a similar, I don't know, fucking some sort of muscle, genetic makeup, whatever. Yeah, so whatever. Like and his brother donated his hamstring to him. <laughs> Shit. Would you donate a hammy, you reckon, Gurino? Well, Eddie's already done it for Tommy Turbo, hasn't he? <laughs> well. Now he knows it can actually be done. <laughs> Tom and Eddie, they'd, them and about another million other Manly fans would be willing to do it, I uh, Well, look, he's a, um, an innovator. Eddie, he, he's, is he the first man ever to donate a, a hammy? <laughs> I tell you what, if you're a real fan, you should just send your hammy in at the start of every year. <laughs> just send it in and they can take the pick out of the best hammy. If you're a real fan, you'd be in the gym right now getting better, getting stronger hammies to send her in, get the boys some good hammies, and you're good to go. Um, but, yeah, so, look, I, I, Manly fans, I agree with you guys. A bit of a storm in the teacup. Like, he is saying what would be talked about internally and, like, you know, hopefully Tommy can pull through. It's all good. If he does get injured, what is the plan for that? Um, just like the storm would be having discussions in regards to Pappy, even though they would plan for Pappy to be their fullback for the next 10 years. Uh, but yeah, now on to recent reports that contract negotiations with Kevy Walters have begun for an extension. Now, they gave him an extension before the start of last season into this season. He's currently, I think, off contract at this stage for next season. What do you reckon, boys? What do you reckon? Oh, I think He's you spicy up there at the quietly. moment. I, I don't know, mate. If I could. For two players to come out and talk the way that some of the guys have. I mean, we spoke about it last week. Those conversations must be going on. They must be going on up there. So, I don't know. I'm I'm really torn on this one. It's And just for those conversations to be happening is obviously a red flag in the first place that the guys are willing to have those conversations and willing to come out and talk about them. Mate, I honestly don't know the answer to this one. I really don't. I think they probably need to wait until some games are played, which is unfair on Kevy because, like, you know, he needs his future sorted. But unfortunately, like there's just so much turmoil, and he and again, it's unfair on Kevy. He's a club legend, but like even if Kevy is in the right, if there are a group of players that you know aren't responding to him, then like what are you going to do? Get rid of your whole squad, like half your squad? Like it's it's almost an impossible situation. But if they come out and they play some good footy first five games, you can go okay. Well, they're responding to him. They're all good. What do you reckon, Timmy? Yeah, I mean, I think first things first is. 
not a chance I'd be extending him. I'd be saying, you, you, mate, you've seen what's come out publicly in the last six, 12 months, see how they capitulated at the end of last season. I think Kev, you'd almost be foolish to, to think you could get an extension this early. It'd be an enormous show of faith in the Broncos. I suppose the one way, and, and I might be speaking out of turn here, so let me know, and I don't know enough about the financial side of it all, but if they were to come out and extend him and just in a massive show of faith, showed the players, this is the bloke here who's got you the next two to three years, would Brisbane be a club that they're one of the best financially positioned clubs in the NRL? Yep. So, all right, worst case scenario, they get six months down the track and then they sack him. And they've got to pay out his contract. That's the downside to going earlier on the extension. Um, if that's the risk and the club can afford the payout easily enough, they might not be able to. Would that be a reason why maybe they extend early? I don't know. Or is that stupid? Um, no, no, no. That's a, it's a good point. Like, obviously, as a business, you never want to be fucking throwing away no. cash. And but there, are certain, club, a, there yeah. are certain clubs who couldn't risk doing that because they couldn't have afford the million dollars to do it or whatever yep. it might be. <clears throat> um, so... Yeah, no, you're right. Like, at least they're in the position. As well as, you have to ask yourself, what other coaches are out there that would suit the Broncos system? I, so, Dave Donahue has come out and just basically said, I mean, he said all the things you would say, like, that, you know, preseason has been strong, rah, rah. But he said, um, we've had a lot of change over the last decade and haven't had a lot of success. That's no coincidence. Um, and essentially, to round it all up, he basically said they're looking for stability. So I actually think that might fall into Kevy's favour where he does get an extension for next year earlier rather than later. But for similar to what you said to me, because like they, if, if worst case scenario, they can pay him out. Mm. But also it does give that sense of stability. And when you go and look at all the teams that won the comp, it's stability arguably that, that is a big player in that. From the outside looking in, stability. Yeah, mm. but I mean... I don't know. Do, do, do they need to sit down with all players and have a real honest sort of session there to find out what's going on? I just, I don't know. This Pretty just Stuart style. Yeah, like honestly, like I, I, I don't understand how it's got to this point. Like they, <coughs> something's got to change there. Something's got to happen. Yeah, it's they just they are, and, it, and there's just so many different things happening. Like, and it's so hard for us to know what's the true story, what's mm. not. Like, yeah. Uh, I just, and I know we said it last year, I just can't fathom a world where at Melbourne two young players come out and say that about the coach. I just, yeah. I can't say it. Yeah. Now, I mean, look, the, the, the glass half full view could be like, you look, they came out and said it. Similar, not the, the Raiders players didn't come out and say that, but they had their issues. They had their, their moment of put it all on the table and they managed to turn it around. Now, obviously, Ricky's had more success at club level coaching than Kevy has had so far. Um, maybe they have had that, that meeting. Maybe the meeting between Kevy and the players has actually happened and they've all moved... Because we have to remember those comments were last year. Again, this is a glass half full um, view of it, but maybe they haven't moved past it. Yeah. But like once again, like with, with, with the situation at the Raiders, they were all established first graders. Mm. And I, like obviously uh, Tyson Gamble, he doesn't fall, fall in, into that line for <coughs> me. And so when I'm... It's his first year. Like, he hasn't been coached by anyone else. Mm. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm feeling you. I understand how shocking it is. I'm just saying, like, maybe is there a world where yeah. they've moved past it? Is there a world where, you know, maybe he was struggling to connect with those boys, but they've brought in someone to bridge the gap? Uh, but anyway, interesting. Matty, what would you do? Would you extend him before the season or would you wait wait till five or six games? No, nah, I'd definitely be waiting. Even without all this off-field stuff, like, they still had a pretty poor into the back end of last year. Like, I'd probably, even without the off-field stuff, I'd, if they were like going all right at the start of the season, yeah, I'd give him another year because he only extended a year last year. Yeah, it's year. only a year on year. It's not like a five-year fucking deal. Yeah, so like I wouldn't be totally against giving him a, a one-year extension, but just the way it's gone over the last few weeks, I'd probably wait at least a month into the, yeah, the season. I, I, I agree. Like, uh, you know, Kevy Walters is such, you know, what he's done for the club will never be repaid. But unfortunately, it's just this weird dynamic where, as you said, Maybe, you know, maybe they have moved on from it. Maybe they have. But if there is a core of the playing group that just is struggling to connect with Kevy, then, like, you can't get rid of all your players. They're all, you know what I mean? It's, it's harder to get rid of 10 players than it is to get rid of... And I'm not saying that still is the case, but there is evidence to suggest that it may be the case. If that is the case, this is turning out to be Justin Langer, Australian cricket team, where they just be like, oh, well, we can't sack the whole playing group if you don't just because you don't get on with the coach, it, that's only if 
this is all happening. Yeah, I don't know. I guess the, the, the slightly difference is the fact that Justin Langer was winning an Ashes series. Um, That's true. In a World Cup. Because I know me cricket, mate. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I know me cricket. Had a lot of people, um, a lot of responses to me cricket chat last week. <laughs> So apparently the lights, the reason why they don't just turn the lights on is because yeah. it's hard to see a red ball in the light. And then I, and then I like, but there's a pink ball, but apparently the pink ball swings too much and shit. There's a, you can talk for days yeah. about it. And I, so I was like, well, why don't you just play with the pink ball all the time then? <laughs> and they were like, well, yeah, but it's a different ball. But I'm like, yeah, but then you actually play cricket. Um, in 10 years, we'll look back on this when every test is in Australia is played with a pink ball and it, it, it'll be normal. But is it a traditional side of things? It, pink only started a few years ago. But also, like, it wasn't just like turn the lights on. There were times when the lights were literally already on. They were on. The lights were on. Were on. Yeah. And also, I've se I've seen I've seen Red Bull in some lights, unless I'm fucking making shit up. I think it's more like f for the. Or is it is it is it pink? But it looks a bit red. May maybe that's it. Yeah. But they t they went off at two thirty. It's just <laughs> and I tell you what the worst thing is, you get like the umpires like have the light meter and then if they decide it's bad light at 2 30 that sets the standard for the entire test match so that means for the rest of the test match for the next five days if there is even if like a cloud goes over the sun and it's the, and it's the worst reading they have to go off like it's just i know there's all traditions and stuff and you can't do this you can't do that but like that's the point of the conversation last week like things have to change to, oh, to save to the game for sure yeah it's just, yeah, from a ca very, very casual start of the test two, season two. Boys, I'm into me cricket. <laughs> come on the journey with me. Listeners, come on the journey with me. If you don't like cricket, trust me, I grew up, I've never even bowled a cricket ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might see, you might see. Um, come on the journey with me. Get to know the boys. I watched season one a while ago. Loved it. Season two, the test on Amazon. Fantastic. And I'm slowly getting to know, like, you know, the players and, and who's good, who's not good, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, a lot of feedback on the cricket chat. We'll try, to, we'll try to keep you informed with the cricket chat. Don't worry. As I said, come on the journey with me. Obviously, I don't know shit about cricket, but I'm doing my best to learn uh, a bit about it. Um, but anyway, yeah, Broncos, tough situation they're in. Holy bejeebas. Just on Brisbane before we go, like, obviously, they've been spoken about a lot this preseason. I assume they will continue to be spoken about a lot this preseason. Uh, round one, they play Penrith at Penrith. Round mm -hmm. two, they play the Cowboys. A little bit of a reprieve the week after against the Dragons. And then they've got the Dolphins, who that's going to be Wayne Bennett against Brisbane. That's going to be the lot. Like, there's going to be a lot of attention on Brisbane to start. Mm. They've got two local derbies. They've got the hardest Penrith. score, haven't they? Got next it's, the start of it is fucking brutal. Yeah. But it I even think, really like... Tough. If I recall correctly, their draw has actually got the most top eight sides or some shit like that. Don't anyway. recall, maybe. But the bunnies to start the season is brutal. Oh, really? That's oh, right. Yeah. Jeez, um, but when you're coming in with controversy to start game one at Penrith, I mean, we saw Tom Turbo, what he did in 2021. He went there round one in 2022. <laughs> I think they got beat by 30 or something. They weren't even in the contest. So, yeah. yeah. How's, the, how's the bunnies' first five rounds? Sharks in Cronulla. Panthers in Penrith, Roosters at Allianz, Manly, Storm. First it was similar like that to last year, to be they fair. Did I remember they had a really tough draw tough, last yeah. year too, without Latrell for a lot of it, and they managed to... It's not necessarily <coughs> a bad thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. But just what a start. It's a tough run. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Bronx have 14 top eight teams, seven foot top four teams, eight bottom eight teams. So 14 top eight, eight bottom eight. So they have... Eight, like, for, like those numbers, they easily have the worst draw. Not not home away, anything like that. But yeah, they have the most top eight teams. Um, uh, Brisbane usually like that because they get so many Friday night games or is that not how it? Oh, it wouldn't know. correlate, no. no. Okay. Um, look, they just don't want to see us win. That's what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Braden Trindle extends with the Sharks until 2025. I just, you cannot give this club, these clubs, the Cowboys and the Sharks, like, the way they have turned around and how quickly they turned around is absolutely mind blowing. Like the Sharks, for them to, they've essentially lost no one, correct? Like they haven't lost anyone. For Feeder and Tolman have retired, other than that. Yeah. Yeah, but like to other clubs, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. So like, whereas like they came second, how often do you see, and maybe someone will be able to bring the stats up, but to my understanding, teams that come second usually face massive pressure 
to keep certain players. I mean, how often have we, like you look at the Eels, like they've gotten raided to a degree. Um, all of those top tier teams that you can't really guarantee a premiership, but they're there or thereabouts. Pressure gets put on them immensely to keep certain players. The Sharks have lost no one and just re-signed Trindle until 2025. So basically he'll be there ready to go when Moylan retires. Like the, the succession plan, on top of that, at the moment they've got Will Kennedy at fullback. They've got um, Dykes, they've got uh, Lockie Miller. Then you go into their nine role. They've got Braley, then they've got Beryl. Th- their forwards are young. You know, Mula Talo just re-signed. Like, it's incredible they've managed to, to pull all this off with zero noise, zero like, you know, this player may be leaving and he wants more money, this, that, and et cetera. Like, even the Panthers are dealing with that right now with the Stephen Crichton situation. You know, with them saying that he wants fullback money, then the manager coming out and saying it's not actually really about that, which is great insight, Guru. You called that one. You said mm-hmm. that it might be a bit about something else. The manager since has come out and said it's it's Crichton wants to stay. He's trying to get it an offer. Um, but anyway, back to the Sharkies. It's absolutely incredible what they're doing. They've also signed Oregon Confusi, who is very highly touted. Yeah. Very highly no, touted. Gun. Yeah. And, I mean, you've got Cam McInnes who can play rap at hooker or lock, and he's not starting it either. And I didn't even mention him. Yep. In the hookers, I didn't even mention Cam McInnes, who was a bee's dick away from getting the nine jersey off Cook when he initially got it. Yep. It's fucking phenomenal. And you know what I love about it as well is when Craig Fitzgibbon got there and he went out and he signed McInnes and he signed for Nukin, what did everyone say? Oh, injuries, you know, are they going to be able to play and rah, rah. And the impact that they've had on that squad has been unbelievable. And then they get Trindle till 2025. There would have been a lot of clubs after Trindle, like not maybe 15 or 16, but we know how hard halves have come to come by. Timmy, what do you reckon about the Trindle extension in the Sharkies? Yeah, wonderful. As you said, just such a show of the direction the Sharkies is going in, the club culture they're building there under Fitzgibbon. Uh, and the other thing about it is, is obviously the, in the halves replacement for if Matty Moylan or Nico Hines in particular go down as the number seven, um, he's a ready-made goal kicker coming straight into that team. We, we know how important that is in the NRL mm. at any, any level of footy. So if it is Nico who goes down, you've got Trindle who's, a, to me, a starting NRL quality halfback, you've got your goal kicking sorted. Because mm. if they were to lose Trindle... And then uh, Nico was to go Look at them, the Raiders. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what happened at the um, New Zealand international side with the kicking? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and the Sharks were in this spot a few years ago, weren't they? Where they were lost numerous games off goal kicking. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was chaos. Yeah. 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 They, they, won, they lost four games, I think it was, when they scored more tries than the opposition. Yeah. <sighs> Something like that. So, That's like, good. outside of Nico, it would have been, like, Matty Cavalu, I think, can kick a few goals, and he's sort of not even in the starting team. So... Trindle, for that reason, aside from a million others, just a, an awesome re-signing. Yeah, and, and as Kempi said, like they haven't lost anyone to other clubs. I mean, they, they, they've lost a couple of guys that are like outside no their starting top 20. No starting But like, even the guys they've lost, Metcalf um, and Frank Pelle. Couldn't crack the team. But no. like, they're my guys that I'm looking for the Warriors and Canary. They could be the X Factor. Yeah, true. for sure. For sure. And they could afford to... You know, not have them in the squad. And this is it, like we, we talk about this Panther side and how they've um, developed guys through the years. I said this a few times. This Sharks side, like the amount of guys that have come through the Newtown Jets system together and are now in this first grade system, they're a really close bunch, the Sharkies. Yeah, they're, they're so close to becoming a powerhouse. Like, and I don't mean close as in like in the next 12 months, I mean like the next five years or so. They're so close to becoming just the perennial top four side constantly challenging for they've got a youngish squad they've got they've prepared for the future when Moylan moves on um apparently financially they're doing quite well didn't they make some good investments in real estate around that area and so like they've just prepared themselves so well for this next generation where there might come a time in five to ten years time where we're we're shocked that they're not in the top four and they have some of the best attendance you know in the comp like that's that's the hype and the buzz. I mean, their coach, how old's their coach? 45? 45? Like, youngish yeah, coach. Youngish, yeah. Like, they're in one of the, they're, they're in the position out of all the clubs right now, in my opinion, they're in the closest position to becoming the next powerhouse like the big, other big dog clubs. He's exactly 45. Is he? Yeah. Hold well on. <laughs> there you go. I, mean, I actually stalk him every day. There was uh, the Newtown Jets team that I mentioned that won the comp a couple of years ago. Their team was Will Kennedy, Katoa, uh, Matty Evans, uh, Mulatalo. Uh, Paul Selly, Magulius, Trindle, Scotty Sorensen, Bakuya, Rudolph, Blake Braley, 
Teague Wilton. That's incredible. Jackson Ferris is still there. Daniel Vasquez is still there as well. Like so, shout out to the development. Whoever takes care of development at the night, uh, the the Sharkies, incredible. Like that, that if you could look at a one to one of like how do you develop players into first grade over the last few years, you could even argue that Sharks the, have been the best at it because they they came second, and that that whole reserve grade side is starting now, except for like one. I've heard as well that. There's a world where, obviously, at the moment, Kate Dykes is the next in line fullback. But Will Kennedy's only 25. He played half the year, this is Dykes, in reserve grade last year at 5'8. And there is a world, apparently, that he could be Moylan's. Like when Moylan retires, he could, he could come at 5'8 as well. So nice. then there's that. And then if, if that's the case, then Trindle's a great depth signing as well. Yeah. So they're looking really good over the next three to five years. Really, really good. You know, like just it's incredible what they've managed to achieve in such a short time i mean don't get me wrong this year is such a this year could be it make or break for them in the sense that if they come out and struggle this year because of the second year syndrome or whatever in regards to the squad being together and playing so well it could just like decimate their confidence and they're always all of a sudden chasing their tail whereas if they come out this year again and finish top six and play some good footy you can almost say that cement them as they've stepped up from fringe top eight team to no, this is a finals footy side now, and we don't accept anything less as a fan or as a as a club. Yeah. Um. So really, really good stuff from the Sharkies, and I'm excited. I'm just so excited to see what the future brings for them. They got the Dally M Seven. Like they got the Dally M. They got the Dally M Player of the Year. This isn't a comp with Nathan Cleary in it. You know, like it's it's incredible. Just on their uh, um, development as well. Like some of the guys in this Sharks team that. You know, you see guys, they come into first grade when they're, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. There's not many guys that come in when they're 23, 24. They've got a heap of guys that you would have thought their career, like they picked up Sifatalakai, who was playing reserve grade. Like he, he's a mascot kid. South Sydney let him go. Mm. He was playing reserve grade. You've got um, Royce the Choice, my favourite from Canberra. He was in the wilderness for three or four years, not mm. playing any first grade. They pick him up. Toby Rudolph was the same. Toby Rudolph's... I think he's 27 years old. He's played three years of first grade. Yeah, he um he nearly gave it away. I think he went and played Resi's up in Queensland. Maybe. Yep. You had um you had Connor Tracy who was coming off. I think it was three ACLs in three years. Yeah. Picked him up. He's incredible whenever he plays. No one wanted Matt Matt Moylan when they signed him. Mm. Oh, they've done very <clears> well <throat> with all of their um all their players. It's Matt, sensational. If and sorry to bring it back to Tom Dravojevic, but Matty Moylan is a really good example of different systems can benefit different people yep. and like Matty Moylan even within the same club so he's struggling with injuries uh even when he was at the Sharkies then a whole new system gets brought in with Fitzgibbon and all of a sudden what he play every game last year Pretty except much. maybe one yeah. uh and it shows you that look maybe maybe it was luck I don't know but usually there's a reason if a guy that is getting injured quite a lot can get out there for a whole season so it is a bit of hope for a guy like Tom Travojevic that you know maybe this system needs to change a little bit, but he'll be able to play a full season again. Played 24 games last year, Moiser. 24? Who, no one would have bet that. If you, what, were, what are the odds you reckon that would have been at the start of he's last year? He played 34 in the three years before that. Fuck. So he nearly played more than he played in three years. That's incredible. Um, and unsung hero of that Sharky side. Big time. Nico gets all the praise, and rightly so. He was incredible. But the amount of space and time and the humble nature in which Matt Moylan played where it was never about him. Like, he used to be the guy to go to. Now he has stepped into whatever Nico needs, I'm going to set that up. And he did it every week without – didn't want anything for it, didn't want any praise, killed it. Uh, right. Like, also, when you can look at Cronulla, they've obviously changed coaches, but you look at some of the players they've lost over the last few years, like Josh Morris, Paul Gallen – you know, all, all the guys that won the comp have slowly started to fade away as well. I think their, their transition, the way they've handled themselves after winning a comp and then getting themselves back to the top mm. without being one of your Roosters, your Melbournes, your Penrith. I, I not going huge into the market well. as well, like not making some big crazy signing and it changing everything. No, like they're just, they're such a good team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, now there's been some new rules introduced, but before we get that, February 1st, 50% off everything. We're dropping a brand new shirt, well, brand new shirts, February 1st at 6 p.m. They're going to be 50% off. And then we thought, stuff it. Not just the brand new drop's going to be 50% off. Everything on bloke.shop will be 50% off for 50 hours. After that, I don't know when we'll ever do this again, guys, but 50% off the drop. So you're looking at 25 bucks for a shirt, a brand new bloke shirt. 
or 50% on everything else. We've got party shirts, we've got thongs, we've got boardies, we've got singlets, we've got everything on there. So that's bloke.shop, 50% off the drop, and then 50% off everything for 50 hours. For those of you who aren't good at math, that's a little bit over two days. Um, that's February 1st, 6 p.m. February 1st, 6 p.m., 50% off everything. But let's get into it. New rules. Grounding the ball. Here's one of the new rules. Now, apparently there's no rule changes, but I think there might be a little bit of... They, they say... What did they say? Adjustments? Uh, amendments. Amendments. But no rule changes. <laughs> amendments, guys. So make sure we know that. No rule changes, just amendments. Grounding the ball. Tries will now be awarded if the ball rotates from the hand to the wrist or forearm, provided there is no obvious separation between the ball and the hand or arm. The new interpretation will allow further clarity for officials when adjudicating grounding. Timmy, what are your thoughts on this, mate? It's hard to get your head around it until you see it play out, but mm. I'm just picturing blokes grounding the ball with their elbow and it's just going to cause blow-ups. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to get my head around it, but you know, it's rolling up there, it gets to the, the mid-forearm and it gets down, but there's no separation. Yeah, yeah. Sounds dodgy. At best to me, but... Was it, was it a problem? No, I, th I thought... Did anyone have right. an issue with grounding calls? I thought they were getting on top of it. Yeah, like, I thought it was pretty... A few years ago, a few years ago, people were grounding it with their forearms and it was like, this is ridiculous. It was almost no, bouncing. Yeah, because there's ago. no control. Yeah. So are they going back to that? Like, is that what I'm reading? I wonder or? if it's because when you drop it and then ground it, they always say no try because you have to re-grip the ball. I wonder if it's to abolish that which i think is silly because that's black and white that's mm. i thought that was great a great rule um so it's gonna be weird to see if like they drop it and then before it touches the ground they do that and yeah. then they actually but then that's separation the though but if it if it goes down and but rolls if, up i don't know yeah i don't know it's it's i feel like it's adding more shit in mm. yeah and regardless of what it says there It'll be set in the first few weeks <laughs> by the first few decisions and we won't know what it's meant to say but we'll know what it looks like yeah what it looks like um yeah, look, I mean, I didn't feel like there was a problem with grounding. Like, I, I didn't feel like I was sitting there each game. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure there were certain games where the player did ground the ball and he didn't get the try or whatever, but did not seem like a big problem to me. Whereas, like, now that they've come out and said this is amendment, fans are going to be like, oh, what the fuck, rah, rah, you know, so um, hopefully it, it works out all right. What do you reckon, Guru? Oh, yeah, that's we, we love our grey areas, don't we? We just love <laughs> them greyer and greyer. <laughs> Could you imagine? So that means if I roll it, like, to my chest... Yeah, where does it stop? Or does it say forearm? I guess elbow. Yeah, the oh, tries forearm. will now be awarded if ball rotates from hand to the wrist or forearm. So the wrist or forearm. So basically all the way up to the bicep. Um, anyway, next one. Operation of the 18th player rule. The number of failed head assessments, head injury assessments, will be reduced from three to two to trigger activation of the 18th player. This will allow greater flexibility for clubs which lose multiple players to head injuries in the match. I like this call. Yeah, I think it's I thought awesome. three was way too much. Yeah, and, and, and until I saw it, I probably didn't have an understanding of it, but I, I definitely think that two is the right way to go. I just thought, because like when what would happen is, is you'd be watching games and two blocks would go down and you'd be like, your bench is decimated because then someone else has done his mm. hammy or whatever. And you're going, fuck, we got like one bloke. Whereas like two blokes, I think that, I think two's good. What do you reckon, Timmy? Yeah, it seems pretty clear cut. And that's it. Like you go, two HIAs failed and they can't activate. I'm like, all right, that's okay. But as you said, you throw in injuries on top of that yeah. and they're just stuffed. So I think it's a sensible move. Yeah, I, I like it. I think this is a smart move. And it just, it, it also makes the decision for the head injury like, that even though they shouldn't, but it makes it easier for clubs to go to make the safer decision because they've got someone there ready to go. They don't have to worry about rotations, that kind of stuff. So I like this one. Maddie, do you like this one? Not like this one? No, that's a obvious good one for me. I think I think like a good example was the Sinbin game when the Roosters lost a couple of players and it just it pretty much it ended up costing them their season. Yeah. Because they had Teddy go off and I think it was another one and they Angus Crichton maybe? Angus yeah, it might Crichton. have been Crichton, yeah. So like yeah. two key players and they couldn't recover from that. Yeah. So, yeah, easy, easy, easy call. Uh, intervention of bunker in foul play. The bunker may only intervene for acts of foul play which it deems to be reportable. The change will ensure fewer needless stoppages while also confirming a firmer process around foul play intervention. 
This one is like going to be vague because it's like, should, is that reportable? Is that reportable? Some people argue that, that no reportable, you know, reportable offences should only be judged by someone after the game because they've got all the, you know, the the replays and all that kind of stuff. Um, I guess you know who makes the call, whether it's a reportable offence. Is it another a ref? You would assume so. Yeah. So another ref sits in there and says that's reportable. Yeah. So it game. all comes down to perspective week to week. Mm. So. What do you reckon, Timmy? Yeah, I mean, it'll speed it up slightly, but at the same time, you can be put on report and not get charged, and it means nothing. Yeah. So they can still intervene essentially whenever they want, and then it gets put on report and nothing comes out of it. So they'll be intervening a lot. Mm. I don't think it'll change much at all. I reckon this will solve zero. I reckon refs yeah. are going to – they're going to – honestly shit themselves and like not want to make a call and take the easy option and just put everything on report. I reckon mm. that'll, I reckon it's a waste of time, to be honest. Okay. Uh, I'll wait and see how it goes. I mean, I hope hopefully it does speed it up because like, I feel like with the bunker, you either put it all in or you just have it for tries and that. Mm. Uh, because we just can't afford for the game to be too slow. Like, I think most fans would be okay with some calls not going their way as long as it's a smooth game. You always get the calls back. Like, I say this all the time, but how often hasn't the best team not won the comp because of calls against them? Doesn't really happen where we we end a season and we go, the best team didn't win the comp. <laughs> no, no season whatsoever. No bite there. No bite. No. <laughs> but but do you know what I mean? Like usually, I, I can't recall a year where we go. You know what? Like they weren't actually the best team. Like this team got dudded two games in a row and then they should have gone through. Um, you know, you could make an argument that like there was a semi-final where they got a bad call or whatever, but I, I think it's pretty rare. Usually the best team wins a comp. Uh, now, captain's challenge. A challenge may be initiated after the referee blows a whistle to stop play rather than only after a decision resulting in a structured restart. So basically, anytime the referee blows his whistle to stop play, the challenge may be initiated. Decisions which cannot be challenged will be continued to include forward passes, roll balls, and discretionary penalties, including 10 meter offside. Ruck infringements relating to the play the ball speed, tackled into touch after held call and descent. A challenge can be made following the final play in each half, provided the referee has already called half, has not already called half or full time. The changes will add further clarity for fans, broadcasters, clubs and players around when a captain's challenge can or cannot be initiated. How good's the challenge can be made following <laughs> the final? I was driving around a car park yesterday and there was a sign that said no parking. It was on the ramp and I thought, that's because some dickhead at some point has parked here. Doesn't that just scream Tigers Cowboys? Yeah, yeah they yeah. just want to like, God, until they, it says two whistles, there's two whistles. <laughs> one to stop the game, one to call halftime. Uh, what do you reckon, boys? I mean... It's it's not still not very clear to me in regards <laughs> yeah, to like if you're a fan you're not trying to take in that much information <laughs> you know like you just um, so the decisions that cannot be challenged they'll continue to include forward passes roll balls discretionary penalties including ten meters offside ruck infringements relating to play the ball speed tackled into touch after held call and descent so anyway to be honest it's all too much information to me. Um, <laughs> Offside infringement at scrums. Let's go. I haven't read this one yet. Hopefully, a full penalty will be awarded rather than a set restart for offside scrum infringements by the defensive team anywhere on the field. Yes. This is what we need. Love it. Thank Christ. Thank Christ for that. It was getting outrageous. The, the, the amount of teams are just like, stuff it. Just make it. Just give them six again. They, they're already at their first tackle anyway. Who gives a shit? Um, the non-infringing team will retain the option of repacking the scrum or taking the awarded penalty. Any, time, any team which deliberately locks the ball in the scrum to trap defenders in an offside position will also be penalised. Well done. I love this NRL. I think this is fantastic. Fuck the scrum, as in fuck the defensive teams. They were always streaming up. They were always getting offside and making it basically in, not impossible because their tries were still scored. But tries were usually scored off scrums when teams didn't break the rules. Guru, thoughts? Any team which deliberately locks the ball in the scrum mm. to trap defenders, so so you can't try and trick the opposition anymore, is that essentially yeah, what they're saying? So, yeah, I think so, yeah. okay. Not sure what the problem with that part Yeah, I, I don't like, have an issue good, with that. Keep that's, the team on side. Like, yeah, yeah. Keep that's your halfback's duty to call when the ball's yeah, out. Yeah, that's, that's weird. That's mm. strange. That's, yeah. I don't mind, though. Like, it is what it is. Like, fuck. 
they're going to call the penalty if they're offside, even though you know, maybe they get it wrong that time. Oh, the, the, the first half that I love, though, yeah. we desperately needed that. As you said, all, all the teams were taking the piss out of it, and you would have been stupid to not take the piss out of it. Well, I'm just on the mind of, like, look, did I ever watch a game with, like, how good he trapped the ball? And they balked. Like, didn't really add much to me. Like, I understand Fair. it keeps them honest. Um, but in saying that, it's a bit of a nothing thing. Agree. Love it. And I also like that they probably were tempted to change it midway through last year when it was becoming out of hand. But I'm glad they just held off until the off season. So, yeah, it's great. really good. Yeah, good it's stuff, like, NRL. It's like, it's like for years we had – I used to hate rugby union fans saying, your scrums are pointless, they're worthless, why do you do it? And I'd sort of sit there and go, you know what, you're, you're right in a lot of regards, they don't serve a lot of purpose in the game. And in recent years, because they're sort of getting a lot of these structures around the scrums and what the defensive lines can and can't do, we're seeing all so many tries scored off. Yeah. So they're bringing the set plays back Give into Give outside it. back space. Yeah, and they're great. They're great to watch. And as a result of this, we're going to see a lot more tries off scrums. And I'm all for it because yeah. the best executed teams score off it. You know, I won't say more often than not, but pretty often mm. it's a great part of the game. It opens it up. Yeah, and historically one of the better scrum coaches, Tim Sheens, too. So hopefully, oh, be interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Now, ten meter compliance in general play. Active defenders must have both feet in line or behind the referee when setting the 10-metre defensive line. Referees will have the option of awarding a full penalty for multiple 10-metre breaches without requiring the mandatory use of the sin bin. Referees can still use a sin bin if they consider breaches to be deliberate or cynical. The changes will give further clarity to officials and teams around what constitutes a breach of the rules. Has it always been both feet behind? I, was trying to work I thought out. it was one foot. Yeah, so I wish, I wish the article said what they went to, when they went mm. from. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. But look. Find out. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Um, yeah, look, I don't mind it. Uh, both feet is pretty hectic. You're it's basically hectic. getting, if, if, it hasn't, if it hasn't been both feet already, you're basically getting an extra meat in the league. Yeah. Because you've got to take, because you can't stand with both feet flat-footed in the same, you've got to have one foot back. So instead of being a metre forward of that tent, like so basically let's say you need one foot behind, you put your one foot behind the line and then your other fo- you're leaning forward in a start position. That's about a metre. You're going to have to go a whole metre back. So you're, it's basically like an 11 metre fucking... That's a substantial change. Yeah. Because I was saying, I was under the impression that it was always just one foot behind the line. Like, yeah. You've had a game of footy or watched in your life where it's both feet. So if that is... Yeah, and, and it's changed from one foot to two. It may have it's a... It's a pretty big change. It's pretty... Well, it's a whole metre you've got to work with, you know? Um... But, yeah, I mean... So does that mean if you're de- defending on your trial line, both feet have to be... I'd say so, which is, like... It's a lot. That's a lot on your line. Especially if you're defending in close. That's yeah. Like, if I've got cheese just got that. half and I'm... Yeah. It's yeah, like if they're both behind the line, they, c- they can't reach it quick enough. Yeah, the rule last year, I'm reading it, he was definitely touching the goal line with one foot and then offside was one foot either on or off the ground in front of a teammate would be offside. So the both that's feet... Yeah. That's a big fucking change. Why, there. I wonder... Like to I want, make it what, clearer, what's, maybe. What's or? caused the change? Maybe easier for it. I don't know, but well, he, like if you if you got two feet behind the line on the try line, like surely you just barge over every time. Tell you what else, like with the the prior rule with the scrums not leaving early, now their feet have to be both behind the ref on the scrums. That's giving the attacking side another, another meter to play with. Here's an early call. I think we're going to see a shit ton of tries off scrums. Yeah, like potentially almost comical. I so could be wrong, whole that's the way I'm seeing it. And you can't, you can't, because like people, even before this year, people used to get offside scrums all the time, like all the fucking time. They now had both to because foot. the plays were so well executed, yeah. you couldn't stop them otherwise. Yeah. So now the risk of giving away a penalty and you're essentially a metre back, that's, um, I know there's going to be a lot of scrum tries. Yeah, this is, this will be interesting. Maybe we've got it wrong and it was always two feet, but I don't recall so, it being. No, sorry, it's, I think it, it just says in line. So I don't know if it, it, maybe they're just clearing it up a little bit. It just says in line with the referee. But even in line, you can have one foot. You still got to yeah. fucking yeah. Then you can't have one in back. front. Yeah, you used to be says, able to have one in front. That clearly says both feet. Yeah, both feet. Yeah. Anyway, it'll be interesting to see yeah. how it plays out. I think it, it it could potentially have way more impact than they realise because it's a whole yeah, meter. It's like, hard to officiate unless you're on the try line. Yeah, hard to officiate too. Um, adjudication of completed tackles. Referees will issue a single call of held release when a tackle is complete, rather than the separate calls of held and release. The change will address unnecessary slowing of the play the ball and improve game continuity. I actually don't mind this, because like what would happen is, is the ref would go, held, held, and the players would stay on, stay on. Then they would go, release, 
and the players would then slowly react like to to the release call and the ref was kind of in a spot well like they did release but they did it so fucking slowly whereas if it's just held release then it's you've only got one call to make to just you got to begin straight away you can't you can't predict the release call that's going to come in three seconds and tangle yourself up or whatever. You just got to bump, get out of there. I don't mind this. Hopefully, yeah, I don't mind it. What do you reckon? We'll, see, we'll wait to see how it fucking plans out. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. So do you see them calling held earlier or later? Oh, fuck, I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. I had no idea. I think that, 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 that'll be what decides this one, won't it? Like if it's the one call held release, I'd assume later because if it, if it's fucking the, if it'd be touch footy. So sorry, yeah. I didn't mean you were they call held early. Were they call held at the same time or later? You reckon? You I'd, I'd assume later. later. They have to call it later. You have to. Yeah. It'll become so quick yeah. if they don't. Because yeah. essentially, as you said, when they go held, held release, you know, you're buying an extra second, maybe two. Mm. If they just call it straight at the same time, as you said touch football, you'd be, be so bouncing up straight away. So I assume a bit longer. I'll have to lay it. Just yeah. off the back of that, and. I don't know if you guys agree. It, it seems like these rules are advantaging the team with the ball. So, like, I hope we don't see, like, a bl another blowout kind of... Because it was good last year when the scores are a little bit closer and they're closer and a, bit, a few less tries. So, hopefully I'm reading into that maybe a bit too much. But it seems like the defenders are being, like, more penalised in you these new rules. You get that vibe, eh? Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it is true. Which is bizarre because, like, I thought we'd found a good balance. Mm. You know, we had still the free-flowing great footy. Like, I thought last year's footy was really entertaining. Like, I liked it. I thought it was yeah. really good. I thought the year before just got fucking stupid. Way too way too open, way too many points, blowouts, all that kind of stuff. Oh, I'll tell you what. Again, there's a lot of this just coming through as we speak. But So the reason there's so many tries off the back of the scrum last season was because of how good teams got at holding the ball in. Halfback who feeds the scrum shoots out oh. and gets it from the lock. They can't do, do that, that now yeah, because wow. they can't hold it. So there's the change. So that's going to balance out. Yeah. You can't shoot off your line, but you've essentially got one less man. Yeah, because I was going to say, if you yeah. if, if you could still hold the ball in... Would have been crazy. Basically guaranteed try. Pretty much. Because each player has like at least, what, eight metres to work yeah. with and like spaces between the players. So the no holding is to counteract how quick that... Yeah, so that... Which I don't mind. That I, makes sense. I that like that because it's saying basically like, look, you still got space, yeah. but you have to execute the play well. Yeah. You can't just, just, just hold it and then wait for the half to get the mm. ball and then just spin it. Um, so yeah, that's going to... From what we initially thought, that'll cut down the scrum tries yeah. a lot, but probably do a good limit. Like, it's yeah. fine. Look, I, I probably half of these, like, for example, I, I liked, I love the scrum penalty one. I love the 18th man one. Then there's some that I'm like, probably hard no one, but most of them, most of them, I'm like, the, the, t the two feet behind the line is what's concerning me the most. Mm. That's, that's the one that I'm, I'm unsure is like the most impact on the game, but maybe we've got it wrong and it's always been that and we've just fucking thought it wasn't. So, bit of breaking news. Again, this is all just rumours and whispers, but Danny Wilder has uh, tweeted out that uh, the Rabbitohs are chasing Dom Young pretty hard, which when you look at squad makeup and we talk about outside backs with the Rabbitohs, would make sense that they're chasing outside back. We've been talking about it for quite a while. Danny Wilder has also said that, you know, they're using the big gun. Sam Burgess has been talking to Dom Young. So Dom Young is actually contracted for 2023. So maybe this is for 2024, but I mean, his performance last year was great. Then his performance at the World Cup was incredible. Uh, do you see, could the Knights lose a guy like Dom Young? I think quite possibly. Uh, I think he was up in Queensland the, the week before as well. So I think he's uh, seen a few clubs at the moment, Dom Young. So, mm. Which I think there should be a lot of clubs after him. Mm. Uh, when you have a look at, you know, obviously last season was great, but where you look at how much he improved in the 12 months before that, like I, I'll be honest, when I first saw him, like he had his, his body and everything was amazing, but... His reads were so far so off bad. that like, I thought he so might bad. not last half yeah. a season mm. here. Mm. He's improved. He's one of the most improved players in this competition. And in credit opinion. to him for sticking it out. So he could have gone home, back to England. He stuck it out. Which I think will make Newcastle filthy <laughs> if they lose him. Well, they discovered him like what playing local league or something over there. Yeah, like local league England or some shit like that. There's a I think it's like 17 year old, 18 year old. And then COVID happened, then he couldn't get across or something along those lines. The one thing that makes it interesting is that they have also got the two young English fellows coming next year, Newcastle. Mm. So I wouldn't be surprised if they thought that might sweeten that deal mm. a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I, I think there'll be a lot of big clubs interested in Dom Young. What do you reckon, Timmy? 
what Knights fans have something to worry about? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the performance we've seen the last 12 months, of course they're going to, is going to attract interest across the board. Uh, and it's, I'm a little bit, I think there's a lot of hype around Dom Young. Mm. And when you're two metres tall, you're one of the quickest in the game, you're a strong body, you have every reason to at 21 years old. And Guru makes a great point that he, he developed his game in such a, a 12-month pe- period so quickly. I'm probably... Uh, a li- not as convinced as a lot of people only because of his defense mm. and in attack sky's the limit but you've still got to be a good defender at nrl level and we saw him we've seen him caught out time and time again and we see him get caught out the back end of the world cup england had some easy games early on in the world cup when it got to the crunch games and he missed a few had a few poor reads so he's one of my the most intriguing prospects for me going into this season because you know, he's 21 years old. He yeah. has every right to be missing, get making poor reads. Yeah. And he was going from English rugby league to the NRL. Mm. You know, very different games in a lot of regards. So there's no reason why he can't fix that. But if he wants to be an elite um, outside back in the NRL, he has to do that. Yeah. Can he do that? Some players go their whole careers and they're in and out of first grade because they can't get their defensive reads sorted. So I want to see that from him first. There's no reason why he can't. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how Dom Young turns yeah. out. It's, it's interesting because... It's, it, he's got this added thing of being English, but even if you looked at him like a normal winger, like you even look at Brian Tottles' first few years, I don't think anyone would be, would bet the house on that he would turn into the player he did, he would. Like his first his first year, I think he was solid, good, strong ball runner. Did we think he was going to turn into a bloke that is just blowing studs out of the water, like totally impacting games, turning on their heads? Like he had the potential, but him to get actually get there, I think it's a a normal journey. You're right though. That, a lot of players struggle to make that journey. I think it all matters the system he goes to. I yeah. can't see a Roosters, a Rabbitohs, a Storm, um, you know, I can't see any of them not being able to get something out of a guy like Dom Young. You know, I can't see them, as long as he stayed at those clubs and obviously, you know, put his best foot forward, he's so athletically gifted. Their systems are so... I just can't see how they couldn't get it out of him. You know, there may be Rocky Road, but I feel like they could get... He's just a genetic freak. Like he's massive and he's so quick for how big he is. And although his reads still do need work, if you took his version of defence now compared to when he first rocked into the NRL, it's like night and day. He still needs to improve. And that's it. At a team like you said, the Roosters or Storm Panthers or whatever, he'll sit on the end of a back line and probably top the tri-screen charts three years in a row. Yeah. And defensive reads, because the blokes inside you are so well drilled and you know, you're winning play laws, you're winning the ruck, all mm. of that they won't be as difficult. So if he lobs in one of them clubs, happy days. If he's at one of the less clubs where those opportunities don't happen and you have to make a lot of defensive reads, yeah. I have that worry, does he end up like a Greg Marzu, who, with ball in hand, is one of the best wingers in the game, yeah. but he's in and out his whole career because he can't get his defence right. Mm. Um, and again, I'm being critical. Dom Young, he could nail it and just yeah. be like the next best winger in the NRL, mm. but uh, where he lands could have a big say in that. Yeah, huge say, huge say. Um, but it's interesting, the Rabbitohs, big Sam Burgess trying to get him across there. Could you imagine him in a Rabbitohs jersey? Again, all rumours and speculation, guys, just chat. It would solve a problem, though, wouldn't it? Solve a massive problem. Yep. Um, all of a sudden, their back line looks like, Oof. you know, you've got Campbell and Graham in it. You've got Dom Young in it. You've got Latrell Mitchell, Alex Johnston. There's a lot of big teams in this competition that are, you know, genuine premiership threats that are probably one back line player short. Mm. Roosters are as well. I would say Melbourne are as well. Mm. Probably just as in you know, reckon roosters are a backline. Oh, because of the center position. Yeah, trying to apologies. work out that yeah. center spot. Yeah, apologies. Um, storm, like if the storm, lo- lo- if any, you know, if Pappy doesn't come back, which mm. hopefully will, or, or, Pappy doesn't come back to his absolute best. Mm. Uh, I still think that there's a few question marks in in that Melbourne Storm. We saw their depth last year really struggled, yep. and the depth come in and just wasn't the same. Yeah, so I reckon they'll. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a pretty hot property. I think. Yeah. Wow, Dom Young at another club. Hopefully Knights fans, though, they keep him because that's the, like, you wouldn't consider they developed him in the sense, like, from a junior, but, like, they don't get nothing. If he goes on to be a superstar, they spotted him from literally nothing. And, look, every club goes through it. They, they spot some young kid from a teenager and then they get taken by another club, but that would be devastating, especially the position the club's in right now. Um, but really interesting. Gun to head, do you think he stays or goes? Uh, based on some of the meetings that it looks like he's having, I would probably lean towards going, honestly. What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, if he's being shopped around, obviously not by the Knights, but his money mm. just taking around the whole of the NRL, probably leaves. 
I just think that because he's going to have such big clubs after him, it's almost going to be too good to refuse. Yeah. If the Knights were going well in the top six side, I think you'd find that like it's easier to be like, you know what, they they gave me a crack, rah rah. But with the Knights, I mean, they don't even know who their coach is going to be next year. Like it, the coach is under pressure right now. There's a lot of there's a lot of questions with the Knights. Whereas like when you get the big dog clubs come after you, willing to offer you a decent wage, you're a good chance of winning a premiership. It's not like we use the salary cap to balance everything out, but is it really balanced? Like, is is it really as balanced as we think it is? Like, everyone has the same amount of money, but is is, is the Roosters coming to you the same as, let's say Roosters come at you with a 250 grand contract, and then, you know, the Titans or the Knights come at you with a 250 grand contract, which holds more value? Obviously, the Roosters. Yeah, you know, so like it's... But, but I also think the situation would be so much worse without the salary cap. Oh, I'm not so, saying get rid of the yeah, salary cap. So it's... I'm saying like we need to find ways to make up that difference. Yeah. And so that difference could be, I hate to say it, a draft. Because if you're a lower tier team, at least you get a crack at the next big talent, a way to get off the bottom of the table. Whereas like at the moment, you know, unless you get really not lucky, but just have this crazy recruitment drive, it is quite tough to get to consistently get off the bottom of the table. Like over the last 20 years, who's been, you've got that crazy stat in regards to the teams that have won the comp or coaches, or something like that. Yeah. The, I think over the last, what was it, Matty? Over the last, I think the 35, last 35 premierships, 22 of them have been won by Wayne Bennett, Tim Sheens, Ricky Stewart, Trent Robinson, Craig Bellamy and Ivan Cleary. Mm. And so it's like to be consistently to get up there, it's, it's tough. It's and then, tough. And yeah. it should be tough. It should be tough. Like we're not saying give handouts or anything like that. But it's just that finding that balance between when the Roosters come at you with 250K, it's almost worth fucking 500K. Yeah. But I mean, like it can be done. Like if we were sitting here in 2013 and we said, geez, if you're the Penrith Panthers and the Roosters offer you a contract, mm. which one are you going to take? Yeah. You're obviously going to take the Roosters. Yeah. Like the narratives can Oh, it, it absolutely can, can be it's done. It's hard, no, no yeah. doubt about it. But I think that the difference, I guess you could make the argument with Penrith is the fact that they literally are sitting on the heartland of mm. rugby league right now with the biggest talent pool you can pull from. And also, they the didn't get lucky. sitting in a bad spot, though. Sorry. Well, they didn't get lucky, though. Like, like I'm not yeah. saying they got lucky with Cleary, but, like, Cleary is a generational talent. Mm. And so even if, let's say, let's say uh, the Knights had Cleary coming through, I can see the same thing happening at the Knights because, and I, look, I'm, not, I'm just playing devil, a devil's advocate here. I agree with you. It yeah. can be done. I just think there's a lot of factors at the moment. Look, to be fair, though, when you look at some of these clubs that are struggling, you could point out a million reasons. Like mm. the Knights, the fact that they've let so many young developing players go to other clubs that are in their area, and, and we're talking about some of the biggest superstars in the game, I, I'd be looking towards that before the salary cap for sure. Like uh, that's, that's the thing you can control and that's the thing that hasn't been done great at the Knights. Um, but I do think that... 250k from certain clubs is not the same as 250k from other clubs. Oh, it's not. And it's, I don't know how you bloody. Yeah, pick, I, I mean, I, I think really, like if you're Dom Young, I don't know. What what what, what do we think Dom Young's worth? What, what do you reckon? Oh, it's tough because he's not proven yet. To, like, is he's is he's you, you, proven he can play really fucking well? Mm. But I wouldn't put him in the same category as like a Tupo, the top or I wouldn't put him in a top tier wing category yet. Okay. But he he could get there. He has a physical ability. I'd probably Fives play. Oh, is that too high still? Maybe too high for a winger. Maybe th three fifty. Oh, I reckon on potential he could pull fives. Yeah, I, yeah, I could see that. What do you reckon, Timmy? I think he'll get the fives, five plus somewhere on potential. Mm. If I was behind it, I like I'd be probably three fifty. Yeah, three, three, yeah, three, three, three fifty. Three, max. three fifty is where yeah, I'd want to. I would, but there will be a club out there that'll pay on potential. But, but it's, the good but, thing is, it's not going to be the Roosters. But 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 yeah. We speak about this quite often about paying on potential, that's often around a key position in the halves or a fullback. Paying for, on potential for a winger, how much extra does that get you? Like, mm. I wouldn't pay anyone, probably 350 at this stage. Yeah. No, he could come out the first five weeks of this season and just be unstoppable and then just go, whack, that's how close he is. But, you know. Yeah. And as you said, it's not an even playing field. Like, realistically, if the Roosters are offering you 350, I think if you're a team at the bottom ladder, you, you need to go 550. Yeah, for sure. And, I, like, that's, that's the tough thing is, like, how do we fix it? And then, and to be fair, like the Roosters, the Storm, um, the Rabbitohs to a degree, uh, all those teams that are like a powerhouses now, they worked their asses off to get there. They didn't just fucking appear yep. there. 
they worked their asses off to get there. So it's not like they were given that. It is just an interesting dynamic on how do you, how do you combat that? Like, I, I'm not sure how you, how you do it. I, I still think, I like a draft. I think a draft would be really cool. Um, I think it's good for content in regards to fan engagement. I think it gives uh, fans a reason to stay engaged. It also gives fans a reason to watch people coming through. Uh, but I don't know how it would work, obviously. Yeah, I, I just don't think we have the underneath to make a draft work. And I also think that even if you have a draft like, you know, Sam Walker, for example. Tell me Sam Walker's half the footballer he is if he's not at the Roosters and if he's at one of those bottom four clubs. Mm. I guess from a fan's perspective, you're not looking at that. You're looking at, like, I want a chance oh, to get sure, the Oh, for sure, but in a few years' table. time, you will be. Mm. When you pegged all your hopes consistently on these draft picks that aren't working out for you because you don't have the system to bring an 18-, 19-year-old into the competition... I wouldn't be so sure that they don't work out. Like to just say that for the five years they're just not going to work out. I, I, I think that drafts can. These teams don't hang around for five years with young halfbacks. We see it year and year again. Yeah, we'd be, we'd be in a different environment though. Like it would be a different. Like right now, obviously they don't hang out. But if you were to get, as I said, like if you got Nathan Cleary coming out of school in a draft at the bottom of the table, he genuinely could lift you to the top of the table. Like he's pretty, like the Penrith Panthers mm. are outside the eight. Mm. Um, you know, if you got any of the the, the and I guess that's the, the risk of a draft is if you do land that guy, franchise changing. It seems to work. I mean, the bloody NBA does it, NFL does it. I understand they've got different systems. AFL. Done AFL years, does it. Years and, um, and it seems like, I, does AFL have as much dominance at the top as NRL? That'd be interesting to find out. That'd be really interesting to find out if AFL have a similar situation to the NRL where you've basically got Storm, Storm, so. Roosters, and then Penrith now that are over the last 20 years, if they haven't won a comp, like... Chops and changes quite a bit. In AFL? Yeah, I don't follow it closely, but I've closely enough. You yeah. Geelong and thereabouts most years. Mm. But you know, Richmond have had their moments. They've been up and down. Collingwood rose up and down. Like mm. it's The Swannies rose again, thereabouts. But it's... There's not, again, I might be completely wrong in saying this, but yeah. there's not too many teams who just who your roosters storm mm. who just year in year out are top four. I yeah. think in, in the last decade or so they've had a, a three peat with Hawthorne. I think they had. I don't know if Richmond was a three peat. That, that three peat was like oh six to oh nine or something. So, oh, oh, oh sorry, oh, seven to Hawks. Yeah, Haw- Hawks was 14, 15, 16, or thir- no thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I'm pretty sure. Was it that? Yeah, right. Oh, it d- doesn't matter. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Peat. And then Richmond had a. Uh, dominant period recently but like yeah. those two teams both have had downs in the last 10 years as well so yep. yeah I, I'm, I'm with you Timmy I don't really know a lot but mm. going off that it wouldn't be as dominant except for maybe Geelong oh, I agree with you from a content perspective it's my wet fucking dream David it would be incredible it. yeah it'd be incredible I'll, I'll let Alex McKinnon I did an interview with him recently and that podcast will come out in a few weeks mm. have a listen because he he's a draft fan and he actually he I won't steal his Sunday he has what I think is a pretty good fucking thing to put forward to the NRL. Obviously, it's going to cost money, all that kind of shit. Um, so wait for that interview to drop so you hear Alex McKinnon's thoughts. And maybe later in, in a few weeks' time, we'll, we'll revisit the draft thing once we've got a bit more information. We'll get Matty to look at the AFL. And maybe, Matty, if you could like go to the AFL and see, go the last 25 years or whatever, and then compare it to NRL and see if there is a, a difference in who's won the premiership. And I think that might be a really good indication over a 25-year period. If there is no difference, then maybe a draft doesn't make a fucking difference. Um, anyway, uh, now, quickly speaking of drafts, we thought we'd do something a little fun. Mix it up. It's like date night, but you do something a bit fucking fancy for the miso. And you community, you're our miso. So we <laughs> want to do something a little bit fancy for you. We want to compare Roosters back-to-back premiership winning side. It's the 2018-19 versus the Penny Panthers back-to-back 2021-2022 side. And we want to have the debate who wins that match and also who would be the starting 17 from the, both sides. So the best 17 that we would pick from both sides. Now, Maddie unfortunately, hasn't put me the squads in front of me, so I'm going to get her up. But first of all, let's just get, let's just get the ball rolling and then what I'll do is I'll get the, the, the two squads up so you can have a look, boys. Henrik Panthers, 2021-2022 versus the Roosters, 2018-19. Who wins and why? Just quickly, I, I just can't wait to sit back and just listen to a guru masterclass here. I'm just <laughs> I'm very every, torn, every, to be every, fair, every mate. Every stat from every game, and I'm just, I'm just going to enjoy this, I think. Yeah, I mean, well, the first thing that comes to mind to me is that you get the two halfbacks, Cooper Cronk and Nathan Cleary. 
I think that'd be one for the ages. That'd be fucking unreal to watch. Um, and I'm really torn as to which side I would lean towards. Obviously, the recency bias of what the Penrith Panthers have done, how dominant they've been for such a long time, it's been incredible. But, I mean, you go back to those two Roosters teams. You know, you had Luke Keary as 5'8", Cooper Cronk at halfback, the forward packs were unbelievable. Latrell Mitchell at left centre, potentially playing out of position. Um, that, that those those Roosters teams were incredible, and you know I, I think realistically the only thing that stood in their way of really competing for that third premiership was Cooper Cronk retiring. So I don't know. It, it's hard to say because I think you're also looking at Cooper Cronk, the most mature Cooper Cronk we've seen, whereas you're talking about your Nathan Cleary, your Jerome Lewis, who I don't think they're at their peak yet. So it's, very, it's hard for me to compare. Um, I, I'm leaning kind of towards the Roosters, though, to be honest with you. What are you thinking, Timmy? Even uh, on the back of 2019 Grand Final, said refereeing decision controversial, they just knocked off the Raiders, just, just the battlers from down south who scrapped their way to a Grand Final. They could only just beat us with his superstar lineup. Does that come into it at all, mate? When, when we look at the Storm and Panthers, who both blitz their grand final wins, and that's it's not knocking the Roosters, but like if we're trying to find, you know, yeah, if you're trying the to grand nitpick, final, yeah. that's the game that stands out. That's what we're talking about the the big big stage. Well, I think Tim makes a good point there, which is something else we need to include is that in and around these teams, which Matty pointed out pre-show, there's a, there's a, you know been over the last six years, the Roosters have won two comps, Penrith have won two, Melbourne's also won two, and I would argue that that 2017. Melbourne Storm team on its own is probably the best of all of them. I, th- I thought that team. Oh, come on, Gurino. Don't be throwing a third <laughs> team in. Jesus. What are you doing to us, mate? Just to give you some numbers, though, on that 2017 Storm side, just to make it even more complicated. Um, the Broncos in 2017, they had the second best for and against in the competition that year with 164, plus 164. The Melbourne Storm was plus 297. Let's let's stick to Roosters Panthers, bro. <laughs> Wasn't this friggin' your idea, bro? We were talking about every grand final in the bloody. Matty threw in Melbourne. It got me excited. So. <laughs> okay, so the squads and I just went the second year for both teams. The okay. second year for both teams. You got Dylan Edwards at fullback, James Tedesco at fullback. We all picking Teddy at number one. Yep. Yep. Charlie Staines, Daniel Tupo. Toops. Tupo, of course. Tupo. Tango. Mitchell. Hurts me, but I'll go Latrell. Yeah. Crichton, Manu. Grand final hero. Fuck me, yeah. <laughs> Manu. I'm Manu. Yeah, Manu. Think about how crazy this is. We've gone Roosters every selection. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but you go Manu and face value, you go Manu, but you can't take away what Crichton, Crichton won them the comp in 21. I also think that we're looking at Manu, what we've seen since then too. Personally, I think Manu then. Oh, Manu Stephen then. Crichton, yeah, then that's a good I would point. go with Critter. That's a good point. That's a great point, Gurino. Because then Manu was almost allowing Latrell to be the guy, and he was just kind of really solid, great for. I mean, he's, he was still a fucking great centre. Oh, he's a great centre. It's been he, the last two years that he's really. But he wasn't the strike centre in that team. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can see that. So, what? Has he turned you, Timmy? Or he's uh, still going Manu? Keep in mind, Critter was the Daly M Centre on the other side of the park the year before this and then came up with the play to win this grand yeah. final. So, yeah, It brings a lot. Oh, look, I'm still going, just because Joe Manu wasn't the standout in his team, he was also playing next to Teddy, Luttrell, Cronk, Kiri. Oh, I'm still probably Manu. And he, I said, he wasn't the standout in that Roosters outfit, but he was still an unbelievable defensive centre. He was still effective in attack. So I'm still just going Manu, but you make a really good point. It's hard because, like, what's your what's your your barriers or whatever the barrier is? It is it how they played in the grand final, mm. or is it like you know what they did in the season? Anyway, next next one, and now we'll, we'll be able to change it. Brian Toto, Brett Morris. Holy shit! And it doesn't. We're not talking about career. We're just talking about selected in you know a, a one game. I'll tell you what. I reckon both of them in their second grand final they won, or the second one. I reckon they both played well enough to win. Clive Churchill's that night. I thought Brian Toto in the grand final was amazing. Brett Morris against you guys. Like, Jack White got the Clive Church because his kicking game was so good. Brett Morris, he came down with everything that night. Mm. I reckon this is one of the harder ones. I'm going to go and cheat and say Toto replaces Tupo and I go Toto Morris. (laughs) 
can't do that, you dog. Fuck. I don't know. What do you reckon? Uh, if I want to cheat like Kempy, I'd do the same. But if I'm going to over Brett Morris, so difficult. But what Biz has done is, like, I think he's changed the position of wing. Um, Brett Morris was unbelievable for so many reasons, but Brian Toe's running for 300 metres a game for fun. Mm. Like, I'm, I'm yeah. going Toe. Was yeah. Brett Morris there the first one? He wasn't, wasn't he? No. No. Okay. Go Toe then. I'm, I'm still torn on the Manu Critter one. I don't know, because you've made a real good point at the period, but he was still a fucking really good centre. I don't know what the answer and, and is. And I think if you put that the, that way of thinking in with this one, I go to Brian Toto. Brett mm. Morris in his last season, or Brian Toto when he's... like I, I think we're all still sleeping on what Brian Toto is doing at the moment. Oh, it's no, I'm not sleeping I'm at all. With you. Sorry, no, not, not us, yeah. but I think people are sleeping on what... Yeah. People are acting like he's just repeating. Because like part of Brett future. Morris's incredible ability was his consistency. Yes. Like and he, you know, he still had his big moments in that. Um, anyway, now onto the halves. Oh my fuck. Okay, so Luai Kiri. I'm going Kiri. Yeah, I'm going Kiri. Kiri. Cleary Cronk. Mm. Cronk. <laughs> Cronk. Matty. I'm going Cleary. Because Kronk, this is going to sound really harsh. He didn't do anything in the grand final except for like. Well, his second one he did. Yes. The first one he had a fuck He, shot. he had one arm. He they did. knew he wasn't going to do anything and they still put him out. Yeah. They That's did. The they did. They did. They did. But he, he also got Simbin in the second grand final. I think Cleary. So you going off purely performance in the grand final? I'm leaning towards that. Yeah. That's why I'm going Crichton as well. I just think in the grand final teams. Obviously, Kronk's better. Well, at the at the moment, but yeah, to me, the, the yarn was great, but he didn't do anything in that grand final with the ball with his okay, hand. Clearly. So I'm going Cleary. I'm I'm going Kronk because he was in what five grand finals in a row. Yeah, towards the end Honestly, of his career. I, I'm not going on their grand final performance. Performance, like you take that in consideration, but I'm going if I had to pick either a guy for one game. Yeah. And like increase been. the likelihood of winning yeah, the comp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the guy. I think uh, I might be scarred by Crichton and Cleary destroying my <laughs> dreams in 2021. Yeah, that's true. So you, so you're going. Are you going Critter as well? I'm definitely going Crichton. So 100%. you're going Critter. You're going Critter. I'll just. No, debunk. I'm going. No, no, I'm talking. I'm speaking. Oh, sorry, yeah. My finger was like that. <laughs> um, Guru's going Critter. We'll go Manu. Yeah. So at the moment, me and you, we only have Roosters be, players be, except for Toto. Because on on Maddie's logic, I'd go Critter because his grand final yeah. performances were unbelievable. But if I was picking it, I'd be going Manu. Okay. Uh, as you said with Kronk, like not only that his fifth grand final row, that was his third premiership in yeah, a row across two Wild. clubs. Across you know, two I, clubs. You know, I love a defensive centre more than just about anyone, and Manu. He's just unbelievable. He's unbelievable. I'm um, okay. So Cleary, only person going Cleary is you, Matty. Um, I mean, it, it, what's crazy is is the decision's much harder than I think a lot of people would give it credit for. I think a lot of people would immediately go Cronk because of his record, mm. but Cleary is fucking so good. Anyway, number eight, Moses Leota, Hargreaves. JWH. Mm. It, at their peaks, JWH. Yeah, I'm, I'm going Hargreaves. JWH. Um, what I'll do here is I'll, I'll uh, oh no, oh yeah, Mitch. I think, I think you should look at both it. bench hookers because they've got Jake Friend on their bench too. Yeah, okay, we'll just, we'll switch it. So, yeah. Appy Coruscant or Jake Friend? I'd go Appy. I'm going Appy. Appy. I'm going Appy as well, but Friend, I, I know. I, he was I know. incredible in the grand final. Yeah, especially with, especially with that sin bin when he was, defending, he was defending for two people. Mm. But yeah, Coruscant, unbelievable player. Okay, um, number 10. Fisher Harris, Isaac Liu. Fisher Harris, every yeah, day of the fish. week. Yep. <laughs> yeah. um, Isaac Liu, good, solid front rower, but Fisher Harris. Like, honestly, I'd go f- probably Fisher over Hargreaves. That's how much. That's how highly I rate Fish. That's how highly I rate him. Uh, Kickow. Oh, this is fucking tough. Kickow or Boyd Cordner? <sighs> I'll tell you what I'm going. I'll, I'll ease the tension. I'm going Cordner. Yeah, Boyd, 100%. I'm Boyd. You're Boyd? I'm, yeah, quite easily Boyd. Okay, I thought that, that, that was a bit of a red flag. Like, the kick-out ceiling is pretty great. Okay, Boyd, Cordner. Liam Martin? Oh, no. <laughs> Liam Martin or Mitchell Orbison? I'm going Orbo. I'm going Orbo. Tim? Liam Martin. You're going Liam Martin? Yeah. 
Orbo is Mate. a god to all, but Orbo's best attribute was that he was unbelievably versatile. He would just be Mr. Fixed in any position that was required. Crazy I'm good defence. starting back. Yeah, he's a gun. But like Liam Martin, and we saw it at the World Cup in the back end of the season for Penn, Liam Martin just became just this bull. Um, I, as if I'm picking my back row up, it's Liam Martin. Wow, okay. I love that Mitchell Orbison could consider himself a premiership winning halfback because he wore the number seven. Yeah, he wore the number seven. I always say he's a premiership winning halfback. <laughs> Who have you got? Uh, I'll probably just go Liam Martin. If, if I can't put kick out on the right, which would be cheating, but yeah, I'll probably go Martin out of those two. Yeah, I think I would edge to Liam Martin too. Oh, he's a dog. <laughs> Orbo, better defence, can cover more positions, and they've got enough strike in the swat, in the side. Like, Orbo can literally play nearly anywhere. I'm picking a back row. I'm not picking an anywhere. Exactly right. Yeah, but a game in a game, things like your utility value does bring value. To your to point as well, I think didn't, Liam Martin didn't, even, didn't start the first grand final, did he? Because they had Kate Will there. So that, that does bring it back to... And also, Liam Martin defensively sometimes can miss some tackles. Like, he, that, uh, he doesn't have bad defence, but it's definitely not the same as Orbo's defence. I would say, like... You know, maybe his line running is better than Orbo's, but I'm going Orbo. Anyway, it's good good that we got this. Now, here's a big one. Isaiah Yo, Victor Adley. I know who I'm going. <laughs> based on those grand finals, I'd probably lean to Rats based on those grand finals. I uh, really but it, it's, it's, who you, it's who you'd pick at their best for your team to win a game of footy. Uh, at their absolute best, I would go Isaiah Yo. But I, I thought Radley was incredible in both. I thought he was he's so... I've so are you selecting before. Radley or is it Yo? What are we basing it on, Kempi? We've based, we've based it on yeah. like who you'd pick to win the game, not not their performance in the grand final. Who you'd pick to win? Oh, the I'd game. probably lean to Isaiah. Yeo then. Okay, Timmy. Uh, f- I'm Isaiah. Yeo. F- for what he's done to the ball playing rock lock roll in the last couple of years, I think Isaiah Yeo's value to a team. I'd be Isaiah. Yeo, Maddie. Sure. Yeah, Yeo's so important to that Penrith team. I'm I'm going him just. Yeah, I'm going Isaiah. I'm going Isaiah. I. Uh, so, so basically, out of the Penrith side, we only have To'o, Fisher-Harris, some Liam Martin, Isaiah Yeo. So right now on paper, we're going more Roosters than Panthers. Um, now, onto the bench, and we'll put Mitch Kenny and we'll put Sam Verrills on the bench. Mitch Kenny, Sam Verrills. Uh, fuck. Um, they're such different hookers, aren't they? Uh, I'd probably lean Kenny, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I could go either way there. Timmy? Uh, I'm Sam Verrills, and I know I've just said we're not basing it off one game, but first try score in NRL grand final in a low-scoring grand final, very good try. That, that's an enormous play I in mean, his books and enough to edge him for me, yeah. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going with Verrills as well, and I think, he's pre, I think he's pretty underrated at Verrills. I think he's been pretty, been unlucky the last few years, and I really hope he goes well at the Titans this had year. a lot of injuries. Yeah, a lot of injuries. And, and like, good. really weird injuries, like detached retinas mm. and shit. So, I yeah. think it, like, it really depends on the makeup of your side. Do you want a bloke that can play in the forwards and on the edge if you had to, Mitch Kenny, or do you want a specialist hooker in there to come and, and mm. tear things up? I would go Sam Verrills if I'm going – go Sam Verrills. That's my answer. But I can understand Mitch Kenny plays a bit of a different role. Like, he's just brought on there to tackle his ass off. Um, you're right though If you're having Friend as your hooker You probably have Verrills as your 14 But mm. if you have Coruscant as your hooker You probably rather Have Kenny mm, Exactly So it really depends On the balance Of your squad uh, Now Scott Sorensen Or Angus Crichton Angus Best bench X factor In the NRL Scott Sorensen <laughs> He uh, fucking no, knew Angus, Angus Crichton I actually Didn't even realise Crichton was on the bench God. But yeah Crichton for me Crichton uh, Sorensen's impact Off the bench Is incredible We're talking about Angus Crichton here Spencer Linu or uh, Tokiaho? Oh. I'm going Tokiaho. Yeah, Tokiaho then at his peak. Yeah, I'll take him. Tokiaho for sure. Mm. Yeah, Tokiaho for sure, yeah. Uh, Jermaine Salmon or Nat Butcher? Nat. Nat. Butcher. Yeah, Butcher for me. So what is that? A, oh, and coach Ivan Cleary, Trent Robinson. I think the thing that we need to get, obviously a lot of this has been Rooster dominant, but you're looking at this Rooster side, like a lot of these guys, and I, I don't know if it should be more credit to Penrith. This Penrith was such a younger side. Yeah, like this is these are guys at the end of their career. Yeah, like you have a look at this Rooster, you're talking about a lot of guys that are 27, 28, 29, whereas this Panther side, like some of these guys, we're, we're talking about them when they were at 23, 24. Well, and also like to your point, 
These other guys have had a career to build up their reputations as consistent, yeah, utility, yeah. rah, rah. So don't take – like, put it this way. It would not surprise me if, it, if we redid this in five years' time oh. and it was completely different. Because Toto could go on to be the greatest winger of all time. You got Crichton. We don't know what's going to happen. Tung was in his first year. Um, you've got uh, Nathan Cleary, who could eclipse Cooper Cronk. Uh, Jerome Lewis, still relatively young. He's won two premierships. I think Cleary's won three, so it's not that far off. Uh, so there's, you know, like Kikiau could go to the dogs and absolutely fucking destroy. Uh, and all of a sudden it's completely flipped and it's more Penrith than... Uh, the only person that I think has absolutely in this two team, and this is... I, no one loves Dylan Edwards more than me. It's probably Tedesco, the person that you would absolutely lock mm. and probably isn't going to have his spot taken. Outside of that, and then maybe... Latrell at centre. Yeah, Latrell at centre. He's not getting taken. But, yeah, outside of that, you, you could probably... If all these Penrith boys go on to do what we think they're going to do, they could replace That's it. it. It's impossible. Like, we're picking it off the team we would have to win a game footy between them, but it's impossible not to... Have the bias of longevity of a career yep. so hard with the um, coaches. If you had to go to the same same situation and be coached for the next five years by Cleary or Robinson, who'd you lean towards? I'd probably go Robinson just because, like, I mean, look, he was fortunate to a degree. Not fortunate, he earned it, but he became the Roosters coach. Um, so you could you could make the argument, well, Ivan Cleary, okay, yeah, he hasn't had as much success, but he's been at different clubs. Like he hasn't had. You know, the Warriors, he, it was a most, arguably their most successful period outside of when they first started was under Ivan Cleary. Got into a grand final. The Warriors, like... Yeah, I think it's easy to look at as well, premierships, minor premierships, blah, 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 which Robinson just wins. But I think for Robinson, that 2021 year when his whole team was injured and he still got him to the semis, like just coaching performances like that lean me to... Yeah, Trent I, I would lean towards Robinson, but I, I actually think Ivan Cleary is much closer than people would give credit for i don't think ivan cleary gets enough credit i really don't really don't okay so in the end there was what four panthers that you guys chose that we all chose all, like as in you know all up so on paper the rooster side seems to be better but again they have that added bias of the fact they all got to essentially complete their careers It'd be really interesting if we could go further anyway after reading that after knowing that we most of us would pick a lot of the roosters players do you think the Roosters beats this young Penrith side? Yeah, I, I said off the top that I thought the Roosters would win this, uh, but <laughs> you know, it sucks. Like we'll, we'll, we'll I don't think we'll, we'll ever have any idea because a challenge like that doesn't exist for Penrith. I wish it did. Yeah. Fuck, I wish it did. Mm. I wish that we got to see, as I've said it a few times, I wish we got to see this Penrith Panther side play a Melbourne Storm team with Cam Smith still. Oh yeah. I mean, we did. To be fair, we did. Not, not this the one. maturity and the team that Penrith is now. We got okay. to see them sort of on paper, but like Nathan Cleary, Jerome, like these guys weren't the players they are now, mm. which is how it works, obviously. Yeah. But um, I would probably back in the Chooks, Cooper Cronk, Luke Cleary, Tedesco. The back line's just unbelievable. The back line's a it's joke. one of the best back lines of all time, I reckon. Trell Mitchell, jo Joey Manu. What do you reckon, Timmy? Like Brett Morris for the last season. Oh, crazy. What do you reckon? Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd go the Roosters, mate, but I don't know. You could make a million different arguments for so many different reasons, bring in so many different variables. As I said, the Roosters, who just knocked off the Raiders in the grand final, Penrith just obliterated the Eels, and it was like just to be no fair, competition. To be fair, the Roosters, that's essentially the same squad, towed the storm up yeah, the year before. before. Without Cooper Cronk, yeah, you're barely so playing. I said, I, I'm team Roosters, but... It, it'll be very... If in 12 months' time, Penrith has won a third comp in a row... I tell you what, we'll try to remember. We'll do this in a, in a, in a at least like maybe 12 months or 24 months time and we'll see if we, we'll revisit to see if Because all of a sudden, if, you, if you're looking at all these players, yes, they're young, but if Nathan Cleary's, you know, obviously the first halfback since Cooper Hong to win three in a row, like it, it changes your mindset. Oh. Doing something that no one, no, no team's been able to do in 40 odd years. Yeah, yeah. And who knows if they're done there. Who you got winning? I got Roosters. I think just those alphas of... Boyd, Cronk, Teddy, and then like Latrell and um, Joey Manu. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I think the Roosters, especially that 2018 team, like as you said, that first half when they beat Melbourne is one of the most crazy first half, oh, halves incredible. of all time. Yeah. Keary played the perfect game, like mm. with Cronk in his ear. Yeah, it's hard to look past the recent Penrith team. 
But yeah, I'm going for the only time in my life. I'm going roosters. Yeah, <laughs> you are a dog, bro. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going roosters, and and I understand like if there's Penny Panthers fans like think that the the fact they have a long career gives the bias towards roosters. I would I'd admit that. I'm saying like yeah, that, that's a fair call. Like we aren't comparing Nathan Cleary at the end of his career to Cooper Cronk. We're comparing yep. Nathan Cleary to fucking five years into his career. Um, but I think right now, when you look, especially when you look at that back line, I actually think the forward pack is quite even like actually i think the four packs really even when i look at it but when i look at that back line and then i look like cooper cronk obviously doing what he did at club but also what he did for queensland as well i think the roosters just find a way to get it done but i do feel that if it was a full season i don't know who would come out on top in a one-off game i can see the roosters with the cooper cronk but in a full season i wonder who would win the minor premiership anyway let us know what you think in the comments section does the roosters 2019 beat the panley panthers 2000 and uh, um is that the 2022 side? That'd be 22, yes. yeah. Yes. So Stane's on the wing. Oh, yeah, Talamay was, yeah, he was suspended, injured. Um, let us know in the comments section who would win. We thought we'd do that. We'll add some more little fun stuff like that. It's always interesting because you just don't know. And the good thing is we have different answers. Um, even, even if you want to list your best 17 in the comments section, guys, and let us know who, who would be your best 17 from those two sides. Um, but outside of that, February 1st, 6 p.m., 50% off everything for 50 hours. Brand new bloke shirts dropping and they're going to be 50% off. That's 25 bucks. There's a bunch of other shirts that are going to be 25 bucks. We've got thongs. We've got boardies that I think will go down to like 20. 50% off everything for 50 hours only. February 1st, 6 p.m. You boys got anything going on? Yeah, Wednesday we've got beers and break evens returning. Yep. Uh, so Wednesday we'll be going through Tim's team, revealing his side and then my shit show of a side on Thursday. So stay tuned for that this week. Okay, Timmy, anything? Yeah, beers and break evens obviously this week and then SC Playbook will be getting stuck into all our podcasting and articles on website content uh, from next week for the new year. Perfect. That is us done and doosted for the day. As usual, I'll go and fuck myself. Thank you. <laughs>